of Allegiance. It will be led by Sam Messias. Okay, I will now turn it to Mrs. Sugars to take attendance. Mrs. Arroyo. Mrs. Stratton. Here. Ms. Friedel. Here. Mrs. Matlack. Here. Mr. Avadia. Here. Mrs. Schultz. Here. Ms. Stern. Here. Mrs. Tong. Mrs. Neary. Here. Okay, at this time, I'm going to move for a recess. I appreciate all those who came out in attendance this evening and for wearing the mask as pursuant to the executive order by the governor. And at this time, those in the audience who do not have their mask, we ask that you please put that on. If you cannot wear the mask, you can attend via the Zoom meeting as a notification sent out earlier this week. At such time, if you do not put the mask on, we will take this recess and we will return once upon doing so. Okay, I will declare a recess. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you for everyone for maintaining your masks. At this time, I'm just gonna have Mrs. Sugars do another quick roll call. Ms. Arroyo. Ms. Mrs. Stratton. Here. Ms. Rydell. Here. Mrs. Matlack. Here. Mr. Avadia. Here. Mrs. Schultz. Here. Ms. Stern. Here. Mrs. Tong. Mrs. Neary. Here. Okay, thank you. This now brings us to the hearing on the approval for the superintendent's contract. The purpose of tonight's public hearing is for the board to receive public comments regarding the rescission of the superintendent's current contract and approval of a new contract effective July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2026. We will be alternating between comments from the audience members in person and those in the Zoom platform. Students will be permitted to speak first. This public comment portion is only for comments on the superintendent's contract and is the time this evening, the only time this evening for these comments. Please speak into the microphone and give your name and municipality. You will have a maximum number of three minutes. Do you have that up so I can take a look at that? Okay, you're good. Yeah, thank you. And you can also find a copy of the contract on the website. The press release, I'm sorry, that is listed on our website. And this contract, which will end on June 30th, 2026, is for a five year period. The new five year contract would set the salary at 225,000 with a 2.5% increase each year thereafter. There will be no merit pay option with this new contract which ultimately would be a savings to the district of just over $40,000 for the contract term. Again, if there are comments at this time, it would be for three minutes. Good evening, Carolina Bevid, Cherry Hill. The biggest problem I have found with this administration is its inability to anticipate hurdles. It does not do an adequate job of gathering input from diverse voices in the community, which results in a react in reactive as opposed to proactive leadership. This shortcoming has embarrassed the district repeatedly, but it's never been felt more acutely than this past year. I know many other districts often took focused parent and teacher surveys throughout the pandemic, while Cherry Hill instead used the thought exchange tool which often devolved into unproductive insult slinging. Parents pleaded for our kids to return to school, but we were told everything was fine, given excuse after excuse that the decision was out of your hands. Blame was constantly passed off onto the CDC, the county health department, and most egregiously, teachers. Effective leaders don't evade responsibility. As it turns out, the undisputed national conclusion is that virtual learning was a failure. Those who we're tr to trust as experts on education in the administration left thousands of children to flounder through a year of virtual school without even bringing back the youngest and most vulnerable learners immediately. A policy many, others, many other districts, including New York City, enacted. And most shockingly, after having a year and a half to think through COVID school protocols and plan for contingencies, leadership still hasn't let parents what to know what to expect for lunch at school, what quarantine procedures will be, or how our schools will cope with perhaps the widest education gap we've ever seen. Concerning the bond, I believe part of the reason the bond failed is that since Cherry Hill residents pay exceptionally high property taxes, our leadership was unable to effectively communicate to taxpayers why, why there still isn't enough money to keep our school buildings out of disrepair. I support a re responsibly developed bond, but the bond and how it relates to fair funding is a complex issue that requires a clear and persuasive communicator to get our community on board. So what kind of leadership do we need in Cherry Hill? Leadership to me is making difficult, sometimes unpopular decisions, but providing compelling rationale and encouragement. You may not be able to please all the people all the time, but you can provide a sound explanation for your choices and inspire confidence. 
If parents had been given reasonable benchmarks to rely on, we'd have been able to plan and manage our expectations. But the constant whiplash of decisions being made and retracted seemingly arbitrarily has caused frustration and distrust. So here's a hurdle you can anticipate. Passing a bond will be an uphill battle. So now, more than ever, Cherry Hill needs a leader to confidently galvanize this community instead of dividing it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bevid. Okay, next we'll go to Peter Sheriffane. Please state your full name and municipality. My name is Peter Sherfane. I was not expecting to make a public comment, but here we are. So, I don't know. I'm just disappointed in the lack of leadership over the last few years that my children have been attending Cherry Hill Public Schools. And I believe that there should be a change. Change for the, the better. We can't hear you. Oh, well, pass. Okay, we'll return to Peter if we can get his line back up. Yes, go ahead. Christina Musso, Cherry Hill. This evening, I'm here to request the board to delay voting on the renewal of Dr. Malash's contract until a later date. Based on the last 18 months, I feel that renewing his contract tonight for an additional five years would be imprudent. I understand that the board is not allowed to respond to emails directly and acknowledge that the public is not privy to discussions held behind closed doors. But when worries and questions continue to go unaddressed in open forums, we're led to conclude that our efforts to reach out to the administration are pointless. Based on public comments alone, I have been baffled at the lack of detailed information the public has requested or commented on, included in the return to learn PowerPoint presentations. One lesson learned over the last year is that the single biggest issue and primary driver of con contention in this community is communication, no matter the topic. There continues to be legitimate concerns as well as misunderstandings on subst substantive issues because the administration has not com communicated their stance or addressed certain concerns effectively. The trajectory of this country was quite different back in June, and when concerns regarding the 2021-22 school year were brought up, they were brushed off. The assumption was made that the country would be in a better position by the fall, yet here we are again at the beginning of a new school year without a clear path forward. I was hoping that after a year and a half of dealing with COVID, a more detailed plan would have been communicated to the parents by now. We are two weeks away from school starting and still do not have concrete details on lunch, quarantine protocols, or what to do if you or your child are sick. These are unprecedented times, and the shortfalls of last year do not rest on a single person's shoulders. However, the tone and direction of any organization comes from the top. Corporations are responsible to the shareholders and customers. If people are unhappy with a company, they take their dollars elsewhere. As a board, we are your customers and shareholders. Most parents cannot simply uproot their families and move out of the district easily. However, they can still influence where their tax dollars are spent. At this point, many feel that the bond referendum is the only lever the community has left to enact change. For those of us who have moved here for the school system, many of us former students, we now feel pressured to leave by the exact thing that attracted us to the township in the first place. Although there may only be a few vocal community members in attendance, I can unequivocally attest to the discontent and frustration that is in our community. I'm concerned that the administration will be unable to garner enough public support for the next bond referendum. Our schools are crumbling and our children deserve a better environment in which to learn, but I fear that the bond will fail as the first did. I would ask you to please take these items into consideration before binding the district to another five-year contract. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Miso.
And next we have a telephone number. I believe it's Dr. Podlos. Hi, I'm Jeff Podowitz of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I'm quoting from an article um, that was published in the New Jersey School Boards Association, School Leader, March, April 2020, volume 50, number five. It's entitled Legally Speaking, colon, Superintendent Excuse Salary. Me, and Dr. Potowitz? Oh, okay. Yes. Do you hear me? In, is this in reference to the contract? Okay, Dr. Potowitz, can you unmute? I apologize, I'm trying to confirm if this is in reference to the contract. Hello? Yeah, this is about the contract, can you hear me? Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, um, this is what it says. Um, this is, it's by the New Jersey School Board Association and it's specifically about contracts, all right? Okay, this is a statement. School boards of education are still required to conduct hearings when they ever amend or alter the terms of the existing contract. The public must be notified at least 30 days before the board acts to approve a contract, and the public must be given at least 10 days notice of a public hearing, according to NJSA 18A1111. School board members, has, has this meeting today met those requirements of notification? Where was the notification published? When was the notification published? Please, since this is really, this is not a, a school board meeting at this point, can someone please answer that, that question? And it's entitled, uh, Legally Speaking Superintendent Salary and Contracts the New Frontier. There's another article entitled Wall Township. And again, this is about the procedure of the contract that you're doing right now. Wall Township Education Association scores major legal win in superintendent contract case. A board of education shall not renegotiate, extend, or amend, or otherwise alter the terms of a contract with a superintendent of schools unless notice is provided to the public at least 30 days prior to the action of the board. All right, the board shall provide the public at least at least ten days. Unfortunately, it took litigation from the New Jersey from Education Association to get this to get this litigated. It had to go to appellate court to do this, and no one has the money. The average citizens can't do this, can't go to appellate court because procedure wasn't procedure what wasn't followed in their case so please can someone answer my question does this meeting actually follow that regulation when were, were they told and when were we told and i guess that's my question and, and and if it wasn't then really you should postpone the vote until it is but uh, you know the answer I, I don't know if it was, but, but again, the question is, does it meet those requirements? And those are legal requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Potowitz. Um, yes, we did meet those requirements. And if you'd like, we can send the specifics to you in email. Go ahead. Rick Short, 1002 Chelton Parkway in wonderful Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Tonight, I question all the serious things that Dr. Malash does. I have papers right here from OPA requests. What do I get back from the district? Mr. Short, it's a false narrative. Mr. Short, it's a, it's a falsehood. How can, how can the delay, let me read you exactly what this says. How can the delay in last year's opening? Teachers were sent their letters on August 30th and 31st. Dr. Malash pulled the plug in Heiberg on September 1st. What does this, what, what, 
what was his plan for the missing supplies when the school started? The, schools, the school supplies arrived on August 6th, all the school supplies. Dr. Malash was on Action News, Channel 10, or Action News one morning, telling, telling the world that he's ready. I just wonder if Dr. Malash knew that he didn't have the cleaning supplies to delay the opening. Why wasn't he honest with us? And again, I go back to this serious question of critical race theory in Cherry Hill schools. I present this to the public. Is this false? Is this a false thing that happened on May 11th? Is this fake? It's a piece of paper, it's a slide. In addressing the board tonight, I want you to know that I understand the gravity of this decision. You are called upon to make regarding the renewal of Dr. Malash's contract. Believe me, as a father enrolled in the school system, I know how important it is, but let me make a point. The superintendent must open and must go, must be open and above all times. He must consider all residents for the community and not call them false narratives and false claims. Sadly, we have no alternative but to come to lead the conclusion that the superintendent indeed deliberately misled us on this CTR information. On three different occasions, the school said they're not using any critical race theory, and yet it's very curriculum used in my middle school, coming to use in my middle school, incru incorporates elements of CTR. And it's a funny acronym known as BIPOC, which stands for Black Indig Indigenous People of Color. This clever ac acronym disguises and disguises indigenous people from other people of color, including Hispanics, Asians, Pacific Islanders, et cetera. This is an important key note. I ask you to not renew Dr. Malash's contract. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Short. Next we have on the line, Carrie, and if you can please state your full name and municipality. Okay, we'll, we'll come back. Next, we'll move to Michelle. And if you could please state your full name and municipality. Michelle Feinberg, I live in Cherry Hill. Good evening, Board of Ed. I'm calling against the renewal of Dr. Malosh's contract. Throughout the pandemic, Dr. Malosh did not think creatively. He constantly took the path of least resistance. Dr. Malosh's inability to communicate with teachers and staff and his failure to get their feedback in a timely manner resulted in teachers not feeling safe to return to in-person instruction. Dr. Malosh's inability to negotiate with the teachers and alleviate their concerns caused the abrupt cancel of in-person learning. One, uh, and cancel of in-person learning one week before school was supposed to start. Dr. Malosh has continuously ignored the desperate pleas from parents and the community to do what is best for our children. Dr. Malosh refuses to stand up for the rights of our children. While other states and other local districts made the past two years of school work, Dr. Malosh has continued to say one thing and do the other. Dr. Malosh's plan for return to school does not work. It has been proven over and over again, remote learning doesn't work, yet we consistently had remote learning. This has to stop. We are a few weeks away from another school year, and there are so many questions that are still left unanswered. How is this okay? Why are you all, the Board of Ed, okay with this lack of leadership continuing for another five years? Please do not renew Dr. Malosh's contract. We need someone with fresh eyes to get us out of this ridiculous mess that we are in. It is so abundantly clear that Dr. Malosh can no longer perform this job to the best of his abilities. We need a true leader and that true leader is not Dr. Malash. 
Thank you. You may go ahead to the podium, sorry. Jessica Fingerman, 1764 Morris Drive, Cherry Hill. I wanted to express my support for Dr. Malosh and to encourage the Board of Education to support him as well. While I may not always agree with the decisions that the district makes, I feel confident in Dr. Malosh's leadership and here is why. So sorry. The institutional knowledge that Dr. Malosh brings um, is unparalleled. There are you know, arcane questions that someone might ask during a Board of Education meeting from 28 years ago, and Dr. Malosh will know the answer. People look to him as a leader in our area and a leader in South Jersey, and that's why he was named Superintendent of the Year. Um, I don't think that you are going to find an equal or above candidate. Superintendents are rare. Um, and quality superintendents like Dr. Malash are even more rare. Um, I know that people have had uh, criticisms that they've expressed here and on the phone. Um, however, I don't think that they appreciate um, how logistically difficult it would be to find someone of Dr. Malash's caliber. Um, he is extremely invested in our community. Dr. Malash, I think if I remember right, has four children. Um, they have all gone to Cherry Hill schools. His mother was a Cherry Hill school teacher. Um, he's a principal in Cherry Hill and worked his way through up administration. He understands our community in a way that other superintendents that you would need to do a national search to find would not be able to do. And in the intervening time, we would probably need an interim superintendent. And in the midst of a pandemic where things are already very discombobulated, just in our area and nationally, um, this is not a good time to um, rock that boat in my view. We're also in the midst of a possible bond referendum um, as well as a possible redistricting. We need a strong and steady hand to guide us through the way. And I think that Dr. Malash is that person. He's also committed to essential causes that I personally support. And I think a lot of people in our community support it too. For example, anti-racist initiatives, the African-American history um, course. I think that is wonderful. Also fair funding. Dr. Malash shows up at the Juneteenth parade. Um, and I think a couple of board members were there as well. Um, Dr. Malash was there marching with a lot of other people. Right? He is an essential member of our community. Um, I see that I'm running low on time. Be happy to email the rest of my comments later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Fingerman. Thank you. Next, we have Lauren Greenberg on the line. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I would like to request that you vote not to renew Dr. Molasser's contract for another five years. I have three sons in the school district a rising sixth grader and two rising second graders, and I am a graduate of CHPS along with both of my parents. As someone who has a longstanding history with this school district, I have been extremely disappointed in Dr. Malash's leadership over the past several years. A few of his failures that I have witnessed are a failed $210 million bond referendum, money spent on million dollar vestibules when our schools are falling apart, ADA violations, ignoring the needs of the special education community, school security, handling of school lunch debt, which was a national embarrassment to the Cherry Hill School District, school opening and closing surrounding the pandemic. Dr. Malash always seems to be reactive to situations instead of proactive. His inability to be transparent and establish a dialogue with the community on tough issues demonstrates his lack of leadership skills. For example, he thought the 2018 bond could pass with very little community engagement. Special education services are routinely provided only when parents doggedly hunt them down, and the tuna fish sandwich decision was only reversed after intense public scrutiny. I understand that this past year was unprecedented and that there were 
there were and still are no easy answers. However, there are many superintendents and other districts who stepped up to the task, were transparent and honest with their communities and put the needs of the students first. Voorhees, Haddonfield, Marlton, and Mount Laurel superintendents all planned a phased return to school in September with clear benchmarks that prioritize their most vulnerable learners, and they communicated this information in a timely manner to their communities. In contrast, Dr. Malash did very little to plan last summer for a return to school, canceled return to school two times at the last minute, causing parents to scramble and change work schedules, kept schools closed in anticipation of going into the red, which never actually happened, and never prioritized special needs and elementary age students. Dr. Malash has said countless times this year and last year that Cherry Hill School District circumstances are different due to our size. I am ready for a superintendent who sees our size as an advantage rather than a reason why things can't be accomplished. I understand that Dr. Malash grew up in Cherry Hill, went through the Cherry Hill School District and was a teacher and principal in the district. Therefore, he has many friends here who will support him and request that his contract be renewed. However, the taxpayers, families, and most importantly, our children deserve a better leader. I hope you will consider conducting a nationwide search for the best superintendent for the Cherry Hill Public School District. We are ready for a strong, forward-thinking, proactive leader to return this district to the front runner it once was. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Greenberg. Okay, next we'll take a comment from the audience. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is David Lodge. And this is, uh, I came in late, so this is strictly about Dr. Malosh and, uh, okay, good. All right, so anyway, a Cherry Hill student has highlighted in a news interview who had been inspired by Black Lives Matter and Dr. Malosh that the student spoke and we listened. Uh, but I don't think Dr. Malosh listened to the parents. The parents should have been involved right from the get-go and I don't think that there was an effort by Dr. Malosi to engage in conversation with the parents on a meaningful manner. First of all, Dr. Malosi has misled the parents of this community as it pertains to African-American history, at first indicating there was no inclusion of critical race theory. Later, it was revealed that this curriculum had been included in, in, in the critical race theory after all. And then when it comes to face masks, it appears to me that Face masks for students should be a, by parents' choice. And it's up to this school board, especially the superintendent of this school, to push back on a policy that could possibly cause harm to students. That pushback has not come. Therefore, I oppose Dr. Malochi's contract renewal, and he has created an unwanted and unwarranted national attention to this community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Anna Musig on the line. Please state your full name and municipality. Good evening. My name is Anna Musig, and I live in Cherry Hill. Um, I am a parent of two children in middle schools in Cherry Hill, and I've been a Cherry Hill resident since 2005. Um, I was not planning to speak this evening, but I wanted to speak in support of Dr. Malash. Um, it's unquestionable that the last year and a half has been an incredible challenge for everyone. Everyone has had to adjust in. Um, I mean, I hate the word unprecedented at this point, but unprecedented ways. Um, and the changes that schools and communities have had to adapt to have been things that we never could have imagined. It has been hard. And I have not always agreed with the way that the district administration has made these decisions. However, based on the way that Dr. Malash conducts himself, the way that he communicates, the way that he makes challenging decisions, I believe firmly that he is looking to make the best decisions for students in Cherry Hill. No matter what decision you make as a leader, not everybody's gonna like it. Um, and really there is no playbook for how to lead a school district through a pandemic. Um, it's been hard, but I think that he's done his best to think about what are the best needs for all of the students. He has prioritized our most needy special education students. There have been opportunities for some of those students. He has prioritized making decisions for health and safety. He has had to work with the health department, the state, and all of these other entities and stakeholders. Are all of those decisions perfect? No. Does it work well for everybody? No. But I believe that he has done his absolute best in an incredibly challenging situation that none of us would have expected two or three years ago. 
Additionally, I support Dr. Malash because I believe that he is forward thinking in terms of looking at what our students need. I support the African American Studies students for our children, which is the first in the state of New Jersey, um, and it is absolutely essential. Um, I am baffled that so many members of our community are afraid to learn history and for our children to learn history. And I applaud Dr. Malash's ability to stand up for something that could be really unpopular and could be a real challenge for him. Um, it, it just, just in closing, I would say no one is perfect, but Dr. Malash brings a wealth of experience, not just because he's a person from Cherry Hill, but because he's a highly experienced educator. He's incredibly intelligent. And he brings so much to the table. It would be an incredible loss to our district if his contract was not renewed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll take a comment from the audience. Kimberly Gallagher, 1537 Hillside Drive. <clears throat> I come tonight to ask you to not renew Dr. Malash's contract. Over his 10 years, he has failed our students, taxpayers, and community. Our district made national news when Dr. Malash thought shaming our kids with unpaid lunch debts was the best way to tackle the problem. Dr. Malash thought removing the history from ragtime was the way to fight the racial issues we see in society and our community. He wanted to sweep it under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. He didn't see this as a teachable moment, a moment to reflect and learn. His 2018 bond failed and he blames the community. Yet why isn't the bond, why wasn't the way the bond was messaged in question? The administration failed the bond. And now you believe that a $360 million bond will pass? The community and taxpayers are paying for the shortcomings of Dr. Malash. While he was the assistant superintendent and superintendent, he mismanaged the tax dollars and allowed the buildings to fall into disarray. Instead of fighting the state for the funds we are owed, he handed that burden onto the parents. And now that the parents are unable to get the funding, he is shouldering that burden on the community. Finally, in a moment of crisis that COVID was and is, our, our leadership failed. Dr. Malash lacked the ability to communicate and give his understanding for his decision-making. He canceled school with, with short notice multiple times, leaving parents to scramble for childcare and broke the hearts of kids who were excited to finally meet their teachers and see friends. Every decision last year was ad hoc, last minute and without justification. No lead time was provided and parents could not plan. Again, this year, there are so many questions the parents have about school. No outline of district policies or communication on expectations. Parents are yet again left in uncertainty that is not being re revealed by adequate leadership. Now to the board members. Many of you ran on change, transparency, and open communication. Do you feel Malash, Dr. Malash exhibits those qualities? As a parent and taxpayer, I do not see it. As people who want better for their own children and the children of the community, both current and future, make the decision to do better. Do not, do not keep failing our community by keeping Dr. Malash in his position. We need a better leader who can navigate the next crisis. I implore you to find better leadership to be the change you ran on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trouder. Okay, next on the line, we have Melissa Bush. Good evening. Tomorrow is the six year anniversary of Joe Malash being appointed as our superintendent, according to his district bio. I am hoping this will be his last. Six years is more than enough time to rise or fall. Unfortunately, he has fallen flat. Some may argue that he gave students a platform to speak their mind and be heard. That's a con an accomplishment only if you afford all stakeholders the same opportunity. Under his reign, parents and taxpayers not only are ignored, but are met with open disgust. How do you pledge diversity and inclusion, but then only treat a handful of stakeholders as if they matter? As if removing the majority of the community from the conversation wasn't enough, we've had to watch our district be dragged through the mud numerous times during his tenure. From lunch debt shaming to censorship to a failed bond referendum, the only thing we can count on from our superintendent is backpedaling, condescension, platitudes, and the occasional mealy mouth explanation. Honestly, I may have let many of those things slide if we hadn't experienced the hell that we call the 2020-2021 school year. I know it was a pandemic in which everyone was facing unprecedented times. However, in fields from nursing to retail to even education, some leaders found a way to not only rise above the uncertainty, but shine while carrying others with them. 
These individuals didn't wait and see or keep their fingers crossed. Those leaders in education not only found an equitable way to return students to in-person learning sooner rather than later, they planned, they communicated, they shared information, and let their communities know when they didn't have the answers. These people inspired confidence, put their people at ease, and made people feel that they weren't facing these hurdles alone. Not here. The pandemic laid bare some of the festering problems in the district, including its leadership, which lacks vision, accountability, consistency, flexibility, confidence, and good communication skills. Our district deserves a superintendent who looks at challenges as opportunities. As we face another unusual school year, a future redistricting, and an upcoming bond referendum, we need someone who is decisive, inclusive, confident, forward-thinking, and bold. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. It's time to find someone with that mindset. Our current superintendent may be a lifelong resident who has worn many hats during his approximately 18 years at the district, but he has shown us that superintendent is not the role for him. It's time to start over. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fred. Let's go to the audience. Good evening, Jessica Mazur, Cherry Hill. I am speaking tonight in support of renewing Dr. Malash's contract as Cherry Hill superintendent. I've learned over the years as the internet grew to take negative reviews with a grain of salt. People who are happy with a product or service rarely comment, but the minority of people who are unhappy will make sure to be heard. With that knowledge as a guide, I wanna share positively. I'm sure your inboxes are flooded with angry parents, but we aren't all angry. We aren't all unhappy. We don't all see the district administration as out of touch with the community. We are living in a once in a lifetime pandemic. Nobody could have foreseen or prepared for this. I'm a parent of three elementary age children and I deeply felt the pain of virtual learning, but the book is being written as we go. I know looking back, we might see where mistakes were made, but that's why hindsight is 2020. It is really easy to say what you would have done when you aren't in the driver's seat. The administration is forced to make decisions that will upset people. There isn't one feasible course of action that would make everyone happy. I honestly believe that we are incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Malash in this seat. We have a leader who is compassionate, accomplished, and connected. We have a leader who grew up in our community, so deeply understands its intricacies. We have a leader that isn't afraid to pivot when the needs of 11,000 plus students, educators, staff, and administration need him to change course. We have a leader who is, has warmth and compassion and they make him approachable. I hope as a district and community, we can move on from this negative narrative created by those who seek to place blame somewhere, anywhere, and tear our district apart. As a lifelong Cherry Hill resident, I know our community is stronger than that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Major. Okay, next we have Jamie Goodwin on the line. Hi, Jamie Goodwin, uh, Cherry Hill. I'd like to speak in favor of the renewal of Dr. Malash's contract. I believe that he is one, the one to lead us to a more just, equitable, and empathetic schooling. I ask you to remember the summer of 2020, when many of us, including our children, watched as a man was slowly murdered over nine minutes by someone who swore to protect and serve him. It was at that moment our students, our families, and really our world asked us to pay attention. They asked us to see that we were hurting. We are hurting. We thought that for the first time, maybe you saw it. And it was in Cherry Hill that it seems that we did. It was the first district ever in New Jersey to create and mandate an African American studies course. I know that there's a lot of noise around what this course is doing, but I can tell you as a former Cherry Hill student who also was valedictorian, supposedly the echelon of the Cherry Hill school experience, I was never more proud than this year. When I thought for the first time, maybe students like me would finally have the language to belong, to know that they count and they're valued in this school. I urge the board members to be reminded that there are people here who care about equity who care about all the students in our community and know that their voices also matter too. So I just wanna say, please vote in um, to approve the renewal of his contract if we wanna to move towards a more just schooling. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Goodwin. 
Okay, we'll take a comment from the audience. Hello, my name is Serena Goodwin, Cherry Hill, and I want to express um, favor of Dr. Malash's contract. I just wanted to say, I don't have prepared remarks, but I've been super impressed on this journey that we've been. We've been members of this community for over 20 years. We've educated all three of our children. One of them was just on the phone. And we just really appreciate this journey that we've been on, that your leadership has really pivoted. I've, I've, I've seen challenges in this, just in, 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 the, in the last five or six years you've been the superintendent. But what I'm seeing is just a listening ear. I'm seeing someone who cares about equity, not only just in the community, but also in the administration. It's a very diverse uh, team that you're working with. You're listening to your staff. You're pulling together ideas. 2020 was horrible for everyone, especially me. I went to five funerals and this pandemic has hit certain communities much harder. So when schools closed, yes, we were disappointed. Yes, we wanted our kids to go to school, but we were thankful for the responsive, this responsibility that we were able to experience as part of the community the, and uh, still, and even with the online learning, not everybody, uh, was negatively impacted. My son actually did better because of the inequities that he faced in the classrooms. So for me, I just think about what I've seen over the years and I've seen transformation. I've seen listening, I've seen openness, I've seen participation in the community. And I just wanted to, again, reiterate uh, just support for Dr. Malash. Thank you, Mrs. Goodman. Okay, next on the line, we have Meredith Levin. Hi, thank you so much, um, board, for holding a Zoom so those who can't be there can chime in. Um, I wanted to just kind of bring a couple of things to people's attention. I recently became a stakeholder in this district as I have grown up here, went through all of my schooling through Cherry Hill and became a teacher myself. And now I have two young kids in the district. And I had a very different view before I became a stakeholder. Um, one of the things I realized more than anything is that Ms. Dr. Nalash has been blamed for the decisions needing to be made in terms of S2 funding. We've lost a lot of money over a long period of time and hard decisions had to have been made. And he's bearing the brunt of that. So I ask the board and everyone who is critical of the decisions that have been made to look over the decisions that are starting to be made now that we're getting more money from the state and from federal funding. Decisions that are actually moving us forward. The idea of putting in a special ed director who is in charge of special ed by itself and taking charge of that to um, look to listen to the community for the bond and to figure out ways how we can get everybody on board. Five years is a really long time. And I have to say that to, to renew a contract for five years makes me nervous. And my question to the board is, and I'm not sure if you guys can answer this, does it have to be five years? Can we agree on two years and then reestablish after a major pandemic if this is you know, still working for us. I think over the last couple of years, Dr. Malash has listened, has watched and saw that the people were not necessarily happy with decisions made. And when he could control it, he has given control to the people he has picked, um, his assistant superintendents and such. It is hard to run a district of 19 schools. Um, I don't really believe there's many people out there who can do it. And a lot of people have mentioned other districts around here who have gotten new superintendents over the course of the last year or two. And if you look actually deeply into what's going on into those districts, it is not working out amazingly well. So um, it is definitely risky to make a big change like a superintendent. Um, and I would, I would wonder if we could renew a contract for two years versus five um, and that's, that, that's my time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Levin. Next uh, member of the audience. 
Hi, good evening. I'm Sunny Reed. I'm from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, I'm support speaking in support of Dr. Malish's renewal um, based on his support of um, the African American Studies curriculum. However, I, I think it's a fantastic start to what I a very unpopular term, but decolonizing our curriculum. Um, I myself am a second year. I'm a second year doctoral student in childhood studies at Rutgers Camden, and my focus is on racial identity and racial marrying and um, in children, um, particularly children of color. Um, I think that this is an opportunity to expand this curriculum in years forward with Dr. Malash to include other equally important um, races so that children um, in our community who are of all different races and backgrounds have an opportunity to see themselves mirrored in the classroom in order to gain the support and education. Um, from, from our educators and from our role models and leaders. Um, I think that this is something that I would love to be involved with and have a conversation with you about. Um, and there locally are a lot of um, opportunities for conferences and things regarding this particular topic. Um, I think that introducing um, histories and lessons that reflect a majority of the other um, races in our community could be extremely beneficial for our children and may open up conversations for, um, other, um, I guess, other programs and whatnot for for our students. That's it. Thank you. Okay, next we have on the line Corinne Driscoll. Hi, Corinne Driscoll. Um, speaking uh, from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, as the mother of Kamar Linaz, the rising sixth grader at Beck. Um, I just wanted to quickly express my support for Dr. Malaj and the renewal of this contract. Um, he's been weathering the effects of the pandemic for the past 18 months and despite the many hurdles and ever-changing decisions based on science and recommendation from the county, he's always maintained the same commitment to our students and to the um, community and to the, um, oh, the Cherry Hill School District community. Um, you know, moving forward, sure, we can easily ask for another superintendent but are we going to get someone as committed as Dr. Malash, someone as committed to um, diversity and equity and someone who is brave enough to bring on a new um, director of special education, Caitlin Mallory. Um, as far as I'm concerned, he's, he's okay in my book. So I, I would like to endorse uh, the renewal of his contract um, as a parent in the district. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. Okay, next to the audience. Nina Mint, Cherry Hill. Um, Cherry Hill crumbling schools and declining student achievement scores are a telltale sign of a systemic failure of our public educational quality and a failed educational leadership. Our students deserve better. I'm asking not to renew Dr. Malosh's contract. Are Cherry Hill public schools providing excellence in education or are they providing ideological indoctrination of our students? Educational gold standards have been eroded by federal and state mandates. In their place, we are left with average at best public education. To distract our attention from educational failures, schools devote more and more personnel, instruction time, and funds for subjects that have little educational value, including critical race theory. Under Dr. Malosh leadership, we have been assured that critical race theory is not in our schools. Sadly, CRT is in all K-12 classes through the following teaching activities under social justice, under equity, diversity, and inclusion, inclusion under cultural, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my time, so social emotional le learning and comprehensive sexuality education and cultural responsive uh, teachings. CRT is also being mandated through New Jersey Department of Education's Equity and Comprehensive Secu Sexuality Education Guidance and Legislative Assembly Bill 4454 beginning this September. Lastly, CRT Crown Jewel is the high school mandatory African American Studies course. Do not get fooled, this is not a history course. This is an indoctrination course in racism. This course aims to turn every incoming Cherry Hill High School student into a hateful social justice ideologue steeped in CRT indoctrination. I call for not renewing Dr. Malosh. Thank 
Okay, next we have on the line Elizabeth. Please state your full name and municipality. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Hickman, Cherry Hill resident. I just wanted to comment in support of renewing Dr. Malosh's contract. I had a, a kindergartner, so it was the weirdest first day ever. And it just felt like it would never end. And I don't even um, like everything that was done, but I know that like as a leader, it's really hard to plan and to execute everything perfectly. But overall, I think that the superintendent did a really good job. I also, uh, I'm glad that he's the kind of leader to uh, take, to listen to the African-American and students of colors feeling, saying that they were feeling hurt in this environment and to push for an African-American course, which is the first in the state. So I just wanted to, to speak of my support for Dr. Malish's contract renewal. Thank you. Next, we'll go to the audience. Hi, Andrew Barron, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, this is not gonna be personal, Dr. Malash. I happen to think he's a very nice guy, but I can tell you as having two students who required some special services in this district, that working with Dr. Malash and there has never been a yes, and there are members on this board that know that there have been, never been a yes when anything has been asked for students. And that kind of response trickles from the top down. There is no excuse for not providing the services that are federally mandated, but get pushed off by this district. And that starts at the top down. There have been too many issues, especially personnel and in-classroom issues under Dr. Malash that were not properly handled. And I'm sure they've cost this district plenty of money to be able to fix them. Um, we won't get into the, the big bond issue that's coming, but the, the hand-picked person that helped uh, move the focus group along and that what came out of that was certainly a top-down push and was not what actually came out of that focus group. Um, I would certainly have loved to seen Dr. Malash push harder to have our legal department go after the state for the funds that we desperately need in this district. But that hasn't happened in his long tenure. Um, this is certainly not the time with everything going on to put controversial programs into place. And uh, I am specifically saying CRT, unless you're gonna put in place programs that encompass all races, ethnicities, religions, everything, you cannot be that singularly focused. It is, it's not right, and it shouldn't have been pushed through, especially in this type of time period. I would certainly not support, not even a two-year, but certainly not a five-year extension under the set of circumstances. And there should be some real soul searching on this board if you move forward with that. Because the, I can tell you, especially the special needs students in this district have not been served under his tenure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Next, we have on the line, John Schmidt. Hi, thank you. I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but it was uh, after hearing everybody was moved to do so. I urge the board not to renew or at minimum delay the vote uh, for Dr. Malosha's contract. My family came to Cherry Hill and initially came nine years ago for the school district. Uh, nine years later, we'll be leaving for the same reason, most significantly due to lack of confidence in the district headed by Dr. Malosh. Uh, Cherry Hill and its children need and deserve a better leader. The past 18 months certainly have been challenging and unprecedented, but Dr. Malosh's handling of the situation at hand has been laughable. I have nothing to add as I believe everyone prior to me has well documented the shortcomings. Uh, the next 12 months are extremely critical for Cherry Hill's youth and making a five-year commitment at this point rewards incompetence and continues the downward trajectory I believe the district is headed. Uh, I heard one of Dr. Malosh's supporters say he did his best. That may be so, but when your best isn't good enough, it's time to move on. Not having a better option is no reason to move forward with a bad plan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right, next we'll go to the audience. Good evening. My name is Eric Goodwin, uh, Cherry Hill. 
Uh, I'm here to support uh, the board uh, voting yes for Dr. Malash's contract. Um, as you probably most know, I, I've worked pretty closely with Dr. Malash over the last few years since he's been superintendent. And I also had the opportunity to uh, go through the interviews uh, for three different board uh, 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 superintendents for the district. And uh, I have to say that Dr. Malash, throughout all our interviews, was definitely one of the premier candidates that we came to. And I, I uh, also just want to say that over the, I used to think I should be used to public speaking. But, but <laughs> also I just want to say that over the last uh, years that I, I had the opportunity to work directly with Dr. Malaj, I have found him to be responsive. I found him to be very considerate and uh, of, of the, his constituents to be willing to listen to teachers. He interviews every single teacher that hired into the district uh, because he's really concerned about who comes into the district and that the district gets the best of all of our are of all the candidates that come through. And also I have to say that <clears throat> um, as far as listening to the students, he sits down, he listens, he goes and meets with the, the middle schoolers and uh, students in, at all the different levels. <clears throat> wow, I'm sorry, kind of cracking them a little nervous here. And he, he uh, sits down with all the students and he's very good at uh, just really listening and really hearing what people have to say. As far as um, just accolades, you know, being number one a superintendent in New Jersey and uh, uh, being a, a leader among superintendents across the country, he's a really has uh, what I say to be the decisiveness leadership that our district needs, and uh, to continue on to be a, that leader that our district needs. And um, last thing I just really wanted to, <clears throat> last thing I really just wanted to point out is that a lot of times we'll kind of, uh, kind of in the words of Jesus, like a prophet is without honor his own, in his own house. I think in many ways, people will look at Dr. Malash having grown up here in Cherry Hill and been with the district so long and not realize just how much of a treasure that we have right here, because we can always come up with reasons and different excuses, but I think he is definitely one of the premier and I would definitely support him <clears throat> being a re, his contract being renewed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Okay, next we have Cindy Trubin on the line. Cindy, you need okay, to unmute. Can you hear me? Go. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I I've been a resident for or been involved with the schools for 35 years, and I have to say that um, this leadership, uh, even last leadership, was not the reason why we have seen funding not be adequate to keep the schools up. This has been going on for 30, if not 35 years. And um, I am in favor of supporting Dr. Malash. I have to tell you, I went through a superintendent search uh, and it is a difficult uprooting process. And Dr. Malash has kept us steady, uh, especially the last couple years, putting the children's health first is what he is hired to do, as well as the board is there to keep the children's interest first. This has been a difficult decision. Nobody likes it, but it's better than losing children to a disease that was unknown and without control. Um, I, I also believe that uh, the stability through this is, is all important. Um, we do need to, to have that 
the size of the district makes a difference. Organization, uh, funding, um, you know, all of that is involved. Finding someone capable of handling that would be very, very difficult and put us behind. So I thank the board for all of their work and I thank Dr. Malash for his work. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Shruvin. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Deborah Samuels, Cherry Hill. Cherry Hill West class of 1977. I've been around a long time. And I would just like to stand here tonight to the board members and ask that you, without a doubt, vote to renew the contract for Mr. Malosh. Joe has been a great inspiration to our students, especially my son. And I am one of eight. And you probably don't know who the eight are, but the eight are eight families who had black sons and we got them through Cherry Hill education system. All eight have graduated from college and are working on master's and doctor's degrees. And most of that was done during the time of Mr. Malosh. And I just wanna share this with you. If you're looking for a great superintendent, it's one that's not afraid to take risk or make commitments. A great superintendent is flexible. They are effective superintendent. They get mirrored in details of running the district. If you are looking for someone who can continue the job that was started, I ask you tonight to vote for the renewal of Mr. Malash because without him, I know where our district came from and I have been in Cherry Hill for over 60 years and I would not want to see our school district return to where it was. We are supposed to be a group of adults. The world is ours to make a change and it's up to us to breed our children so that they can stand one day for what is right and not feel bad for it. So I asked you to please renew the contract of Mr. Malosh. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the audience. Alani Harris, Cherry Hill. Being a superintendent without the support needed in the administration with no assistant superintendents or ones who leave to become superintendents of other districts is impossible in a district of 11,000. And this is a task that Dr. Malash has done for several years. He has only the best interest of our children in mind. And I know this from having four children in the district. He does not speak down to children, but rather bends down to their level to speak with them at eye level in middle school and high school. He has um, meetings as well. Communication is key. If I send an email to someone, I expect a response within 24 to 36 hours. I always get one from the superintendent. The same cannot be said by others in this district, including board leaders. The superintendent listens to the students and educates them in the best way possible. He answers to the parents, but he does not answer to any one parent. He answers to all of us. So although there are some that are unhappy, many are excited by the, super, by the superintendent and the excellent education students are getting here. If you are truly upset by the education in Cherry Hill, there would be nothing keeping you here. No amount of taxes or job would keep you here, especially with the flexibility given for remote work during this pandemic. Children come first and especially their education. The superintendent meets and succeeds those goals and his contract should be renewed. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the audience. Hi, John Papika, Cherry Hill. I just wanted to speak out against renewal of the contract. Uh, I do believe in being directed to the point, so I'm not going to echo everything that was said by those before me, but I do want to call out two things that I feel are important. First is in reference to the bond. Uh, I have a two and a four-year-old, and whatever the result of the bond may be, that will not be paid off with an opportunity for another bond before they are actually out of school. So any decision made tonight will roll directly into that bond decision and will have to be lived with till everyone in this room had kids are out of our district. 
And secondly, uh, everyone on the board just about ran for change. And this is probably the uh, one of the biggest times in recent history that we can get that change in the district to uh, right the ship, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have on the line, Steffi Graff. Hi, I, uh, Stephanie Graff, Terry Home, New Jersey. I am calling to um, speak in favor of renewing Dr. Malash's contract. Um, I think some of the things that people don't know of the difficulties that this district have encountered is that our infrastructure issues and our needs for a bond are twofold. It's a result of decisions made by uh, at least two to three previous superintendents. These are issues that Dr. Malash has inherited um, and has prioritized our curriculum and um, our teachers and things like that over the buildings at that point. And, and curriculum comes first, learning comes first. Um, so now we are left with a bond that is needed and infrastructure issues that have existed long before Dr. Malash was in these roles. Um, I think the other thing that's critical is that when Dr. Malash came into the superintendent role, there has been a complete lack of um, being able to maintain assistant superintendents. They have left for various reasons, um, mainly other jobs um, and higher, higher positions. So he has been left to run this district, um, a district of almost 11,000 um, students with not a lot of support underneath him. Part of that was also the skinning down of administration um, with some of the lack of funding that we have encountered. And so that is where the district has chosen to cut first. Um, so when you look around and you really look at other districts and you see how many principals and how many assistant superintendents are running those districts um, that are a quarter of the size, they have double the amount of people at their administration level doing the work that needs to get done than we have been able to have. Um, the increase in superintendents over the last year, year and a half is something that's desperately needed and will allow us to be able to move forward. Um, I think that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Graff. Next, we'll go to the audience. Hi, my name is Renee Sherfain, I'm also from Cherry Hill. I was born and raised here. I graduated from Cherry Hill West where we're, we're at tonight. Um, I just two months ago birthed my third child into this district and look forward to seeing all three of my daughters grow here as well. So uh, my oldest daughter is going into second grade here and um, I didn't plan on speaking tonight. I actually didn't even plan on coming tonight, but I, from hearing what everyone's saying, I'd like to put my two cents in as well. Last year, I promise this is re relevant. Last year in February, I took a job as a manager of South Jersey's most busy intensive care unit um, at one of our neighboring hospitals. One month later, we got our first COVID patient. Around the same time, school shut down and everybody had to scramble to make decisions. The hardest part of my year last year was trying to figure out how to manage online school, childcare, paying for extra childcare because my daughter wasn't in school. Um, and I, I can honestly say that that was harder than having to make a lot of the last minute and crazy decisions that we had to, to support not only one of our own community members in our hospital, but all of South Jersey pushing into North Jersey. I understand that what we dealt with last year, nobody could expect and nobody knew the right way to do it, but there is a good way to do things. And the best way to do things is to listen to all options and take everybody's um, opinions and suggestions into consideration. We had to reach out to um, national hospitals to figure out what we were gonna do with our patients and the best way to turn a 30 bed ICU into 96 beds. We made a lot of bad decisions, but we learned from them when we grew from them. and. The first and foremost, the thing that we tried to do the most was continue communication and stay open with our nurses and our staff. I, I don't feel as though communication was the best that it could have been last year. So I don't, I since I'm new to this district as a parent, I don't have a suggestion honestly of whether or not to renew, but I do ask you, just like last year when I had to go home and lay my head on my pillow, knowing that I made the best decision for my patients and my patient's family, I ask you to whatever decision that you do make to make sure it's the best decision for our students and for our parents as well. Thank you. 
Next, we have Nassim Brady on the line. If you could unmute your line, Nassim. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Nassim Brady, um, Cherry Hill resident, product of Cherry Hill Public School System. I'm, I'm calling in to voice my support for Dr. Malash. Um, it's been a very difficult year for everybody. And I don't think um, changing of leadership is what we need right now. I think we need a steady hand. And I personally have met with Dr. Malash. Um, I've met with Ms. Mallory, and I can tell you that they have the best interests of our children at heart. Um, he's an advocate for students of special need. And um, I would just urge the board to renew his contract and um, you know, believe that he shares the same values that most of the residents of Cherry Hill do. We believe in science, we believe in kindness, and um, I really urge the board to support Dr. Malash's contract. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Hi, Danny Elmore, 25 Birchwood Park Drive, South Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I am in favor of renewing the contract uh, with Dr. Malosh. Um, I've known Dr. Malosh since he's come here. He's been an individual who um, is willing to meet uh, with whatever group would like to speak to him on the issues uh, that are ongoing. Um, I've had several meetings with him uh, in, in regard to issues concerning uh, our children, African-American children at school who felt uncomfortable about students who were, who were placing their hands on other students' hair, students who felt uncomfortable in the classrooms uh, because they were not being taught uh, African-American studies. Uh, over the years, there have been so many flashpoints that I really cannot express uh, what's going on. Perhaps people don't know what our students go through on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, students who are uh, different from them. You know, I look at this board right now and I, I respect you. I know that uh, Dr. Malosh has picked uh, his staff carefully. Uh, it's a, a very diverse staff, but, I, I, but you can assure that that staff uh, uh, gets national recognition for their work in the specific areas that they give you, just like you do, Dr. Beloche. There's a reason that you're number one, because you are willing to meet with people to discuss whatever issues there are, whether it's a bond referendum, uh, whether uh, uh, it is uh, going back to school, meeting with teachers unions. I, I, I heard someone say he doesn't meet with teachers, but certainly going back to school was one of those things that had to go through teachers unions. You've always been willing to sit down and, and express what's best for your students, uh, how they can excel, and I appreciate that. I was uh, extremely um, uh, uh, concerned about some of the questions about the African American Studies course, uh, because for 30 years I have been trying to get the, a course, a mandatory course here, along with uh, other individuals from the community, because it's essential that, that students know that they come from a rich background, that they, have, uh, that they share in common uh, with other uh, African-Americans, the rich, rich uh, uh, contributions that African-Americans have given to the society. We are, uh, are usually, our history books start with slavery, and end with uh, uh, some type of uh, civil right, rights infractions. They're never seen as uh, full citizens. I thank you for doing this. Uh, I feel like uh, some people are just like the people that stand at the door and did allow blacks in after the civil, uh, after uh, the- Thank you, Mr. Elmore. I appreciate it, but I, I just wanna say that I, I do appreciate it. I think this course is necessary. And I thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you, Mr. Elmer. Next on the line, we have a number that begins with 215. 
Hi, uh, this is Steve Tulo. Uh, I just, 1537 Hillside Drive. I just wanted to echo, uh, I won't take a lot of time, but I just want to echo the sentiments of all the previous callers who were uh, not in favor of renewing Dr. Malash's contract. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, again, everybody prior to me has expressed uh, very well all the different reasons why. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to the audience. Good evening. My name is Pat McCargo, and I am a lifelong resident of Cherry Hill. And I graduated from Cherry Hill West in 1965. So, and as a matter of fact, Dr. Malosh graduated with one of my daughters who came through the system, who was a special ed student. And so I wanna tell you, that I believe, I firmly believe that this board has a duty and an obligation to its, all of its citizens to support Dr. Malouche by renewing his contract. I've heard so many things about Dr. Malouche. He doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. Well, I can tell you for the past 30 years in this district, I've been coming to board meetings and talking to various superintendents about how our kids felt in a class, um, in, a, in a district that was, majority Caucasian, uh, and someone mentioned about hair. Well, I can tell you that when my daughter came through here, she had silky hair, and people would ask her, well, what are you? She said, what are you talking about? Why does it matter? Well, you have silky hair. Well, why do you have silky hair? And she said, because I do. And she was in a class, I had another daughter who was in a classroom who, uh, when they were doing Huck Finn, and she sat in the classroom by herself, one student, by one African-American student who consistently had to hear the word and over and over again. Well, as a community, we worked through that. We worked through that and changed how Huckfin was being taught. Dr. Malosh is a leader. He sits down and he does listen. And for people to say that he, he's not open or he's not giving information to the community, the community had the opportunity to come and, and talk with the road forward. That was an initiative where Community members and teachers came out to talk about how we could help the district and Dr. Malouche through this once in a lifetime, I hope, pandemic. And I'm really disheartened. I have to tell you, I'm really disheartened about what I've heard tonight about this African-American studies program because that wasn't done overnight. There was lots of conversations going on in there and they keep using the bug buzzword critical race theory. Well, you know, that's, that's a way to say, no, we don't want it and I'm disheartened to hear such racist comments coming out of people. I, I could, hard, could, could hardly hold back. But I want you to know, I wholeheartedly support Dr. Malouche and my four daughters who have children. One of my daughters has a, a, one daughter left. She graduates in another year. She's going back in as a junior and she works in probation, but they all support Dr. Malouche. My family members and a, a group of people that we know in my neighborhood stand firmly behind Dr. Malouche and I would ask that you do what's best for this district and renew his contract. Thank you, Ms. McCargo. Next, we have on the line, Jessica Cohen. <clears throat> Hi, Jessica Cohen, Cherry Hill. I'm calling to uh, express my support for Dr. Malouche's contract renewal. I grew up in Cherry Hill from Johnson Elementary through Cherry Hill East and I have a child now in the district. The past year plus has not only been extremely difficult, it's been utterly unprecedented. And I think sometimes we forget that now that we've been in this so long, um, we, we kind of forget that this really came out of nowhere um, and that tough decisions consistently needed to be made frequently with little information or data. Tough, impactful decisions involving the health and safety of students, staff, the community, and a multitude of other factors. As bystanders in the community, it is exponentially easier to sit back now with all of the information that we have today and criticize decisions that have been made in unideal situations and pretend we might have known better what to do. As bystanders, it is also exponentially easier to myopically focus on single issues and criticize how they're handled as if there isn't a balance of responsibilities and obligations that must be considered. That's a fundamentally oversimplistic and naive view of what it requires to be a superintendent. 
there is an infinite number of factors and complexities that we never see on the community side. Dr. Malosh has consistently acted in the best interest of the students, staff, and community uh, throughout this incredibly difficult time. And I thank him for his service and apologize on, on behalf of those who support him for some of the things that have been said tonight. And I would implore the board to renew his contract. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Good evening, Nick Bevid, Terry Hill, uh, I'll be short. Uh, I'd like to request that the vote uh, to renew Dr. Malash's contract be postponed until the entirety of the board is present to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bevin. Next, we have Sarah Jocelyn on the line. This is off. This is Sarah Jocelyn. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, Sarah Jocelyn from Cherry Hill, and I I would like to speak in support of Dr. L uh, Mr. M Malosh. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Cherry Hill. Both of my children graduated uh, from Cherry Hill West, and they view Cherry Hill education as a model for their own children. We look highly at the fact that Cherry Hill has uh, uh, schools of character here, that we do, uh, that we have a diversity of students in our community, that we teach children that they should be getting along with their with all the classmates that they have. Now that is an expectation in the real world. And everything that we do to move children forward with that kind of thinking helps to make a better society. Um, I, I feel that the importance of social emotional learning is extremely uh, valid. We want to have acceptance. We want to have children have a good self image of themselves and, and schools of character and teaching about all backgrounds is extremely important. I have had the opportunity to uh, work with um, uh, the superintendent over time. I was one of the original people that was involved with coffee with the superintendent. So it's over a period of years. And not, while I have not always had the same opinion, we've always had productive discussions he has listened. He has supported the, imp the importance of the best for the district, the district students, parents, and staff. And I strongly urge you to um, renew the contract with the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to the audience. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Malosh, for your leadership. Thank you. I want to thank you personally. I grew up here in Cherry Hill. I graduated here from Cherry Hill West in 94. My family's been here since this was Delaware Township. And we have deep roots here in, the, in this town. I wanna thank you for your leadership and your standard of excellence that the board continues to promote for the education of all of the students here. Um, and I'm gonna keep mine short as much as I can, but just personally thanking you. My son, a, a young black man who we were in a former district for a little bit. And then I decided to bring him back home to the district that I know that would help him. The other district was willing to allow him to slip through the cracks. His education wasn't a priority, but I knew that here in Cherry Hill, that education is a priority for all children. So I just wanna thank you again. And I'm asking the board, yes, please reinstate Dr. Maloche. He's doing a very good job. Thank you. Okay. Next we'll go to the audience. Uh, good evening. My name is Ed Farmer, a uh, resident, recent resident of Cherry Hill. My kids were actually already grown and out of school before I moved here. So I don't really have a view of Dr. Malosh, positive or negative. I have basically what I've heard tonight, which has been a lot of good and a lot of not so good. Um, my issue tonight is that We've gone through 18 months of rapidly fluctuating situation and changes. Um, and that's going to continue. It's continuing tonight while we're here discussing whether or not to extend 
the contract of Dr. Malouche. We're not talking about renewing his contract. It's not an in or out deal. It's something that doesn't need to be done right now. And the board is talking about committing to close to $1 million over the next four to five years. Um, and I think that this vote should be postponed until later in the school year when we're closer to the expiration of his current contract. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Good evening, Jen Nadio, Cherry Hill uh, Township. Um, first of all, I apologize. I wanted to be here longer, but I had to watch the West Marching Band. So sorry, I have my priorities. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to point out is that whatever the choice is, the goals that this board decided upon a couple weeks ago during their goal meeting, they have to be pushed because whoever the superintendent is, it doesn't matter. If we don't start having more inclusion in this district, I applaud many of you on the board because you were talking about special education. You were talking about ADA changes. You were talking about equity for all students, equality for all students. That's where this district needs to make their changes. And that's what you were talking about having the district follow. So keep up the good work, keep creating these uh, goals for the district that are going to include everyone. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nadia. We'll go to the audience. And I'm on 1017 Edgemore Road. I know that all nine of you received my email of last week. But the one thing I'm going to reiterate is that Dr. Joe Malosh has worked with one fifth of his staff for the last three years. And how does that work? I work in a dental practice, very small practice. We were down to two employees and the dentist. How do you think that that worked? So you don't have enough staff. You have God awful pandemic that none of us knows how to cope with initially. Some of us still don't know how to cope with it initially. All in all, I don't see not renewing Dr. Joseph Malash's contract, mainly because you need continuity right now. If you thought it was bad now, you should have been around in the years of 64, 67, Vietnam, et cetera, when we needed real leadership and we got it to a certain degree. What this district has experienced is just as an educational level and as individuals is un unprecedented. But I will say this, a superintendent cannot lead unless he has direction from his fellow, from his board members. It's called at the direction of the board. And I have been watching this board for the last three years. There's not a lot of direction. So if we're gonna cast blame, we all need to share that burden, myself included, because I am certainly not perfect. Nothing is perfect in an imperfect world. I encourage you to renew this contract because who else gives up their merit pay for five years and pretty much a frozen income? I certainly not so sure that I would do that. It's only increased by a certain percentage. But I will say this, you have board members who don't pay attention you have board members who say that they ask questions. I did an Oprah request. And guess what? That board member wasn't asking questions of the things that I'm allowed to know about. My other issue is it's come to my attention that Ms. Arroyo moved out of this district, kept her kids here, and then brought them back. If I'm not mistaken, if we didn't pay for that service, then someone needs to be paying for that. My other issue is Ms. Tong. Ms. Tong is running with two other candidates and on the Facebook, whatever, the question is being asked, who should be, who, what, what should we do with the superintendent? I believe that's an ethical violation. So as we all cast blame out here, and perhaps sometimes in the boardroom, 
let's not forget that you are all supposed to work together. And some of us out here would like to help you. I will be glad to help Dr. Malash in the next five years if I'm still alive. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ryan. Okay, that then brings us to the end of. Oh, okay. I, I was waiting for the Zoom. No, no one. No, okay. you can go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Nance, and I am a recent uh, resident to Cherry Hill one year. I've been studying Cherry Hill for quite some time. And as a recent taxpayer and stakeholder, I am not in favor of extending or renewing a contract for Dr. Maloche. Having an African-American studies course is great. Having cultural studies courses are great, but having CRT, critical race theory, intertwined in any cultural studies group is an insult. It is an insult to me and all who taught me and anyone here with a tablet, phone, desktop. You can Google how critical race theory came into existence. Curriculums with critical race theory based in its foundation is wrong. Curriculums are formulated and operated by human beings and human beings operate based on belief systems. As human beings, our identity is not wrapped up in the color of our skin and critical race theory is based on the premise of segregation, racism and Marxism. Google it, you all have laptops, we all have tablets, and we all have smartphones. So as a human being, we're wrapped up in how we were created by our creator, not the color of our skin. And to have a superintendent or anyone in the public education, in the public school system, be in favor of teaching a curriculum based in racism in any form should be an insult to us as human beings. I was not educated in the Cherry Hill public school system. So I can't speak on years and years and years. I can speak on research and I can speak on living here for one year. I can speak from teachers that I know personally and students that have attended this school and have taught in this school. So although I was not educated here in the Cherry Hill Public Schools, I am a, I'm, a, I'm a taxpayer and I'm a stakeholder and I am not in favor of extending or renewing his contract, whatever it is, extending, renewing, whatever. There is no reason to have any culture of, of people have their history taught based in any type of racism, segregation, or divisiveness. That's extremely insulting to us as human beings. So I will again say I am not in favor of renewing or extending anyone's contract that thinks a curriculum based in that is necessary for our children. I am the product of black, white, Native American people. Teach me everything. Teach me the history about all of it, but teach me history. Don't teach me and don't teach my children and my grandchildren, don't teach my neighbors and my fellow Cherry Hillians anything but history about people and it should never be based on someone's race, which critical race theory has its foundation in that from the 70s. Google it. Thank you.
Okay, go ahead. Sir. Sure. Uh, Yoni Yarish, Cherry Hill. I've debated long and hard if I was going to speak or not, but these comments have been upsetting. As someone who dedicates himself and is on a lifelong journey, if you want to study Dr. Helms' study of the identity model, of white identity model, there are multiple facets. I am only just beginning my own journey of that, but I am fortunate to be in a district led by Dr. Malash, who sets this as a president. I'm now going to quote from my mentor and one of my professors who is a giant when it comes to this, Dr. Kiyati Joshi, who in fact has faced death threats for her support of equity and education. That is where we are in this country. That is where we are in this township. Racism is alive and well in Cherry Hill, and Dr. Malash leads the effort in fighting back about that every day of his existence. He has taught me better than this from every moment. I'm a benefit of his education, even though I'm not a student in the district anymore. I know my kids will be better because he helms it at the top. Anti-racism education begins at the top and trickles down from there. And we are fortunate that our district is led by five of the most incredible anti-racist educators, all sitting behind Dr. Malash tonight. Anti-racist education is multifaceted. It starts with teachers and helps them recognize the biases and privileges that bring in, into the classroom about religion, race, sexual orientation, class, and gender. How their own identity shapes their interactions with students. It also involves theories and information that probably weren't part of the teachers' K-12 or undergraduate studies. None of this is normal for them. It is all about going above and beyond. And Dr. Malash makes it comfortable for people to go outside and to acknowledge the biases of their education. Going into this, this word CRT constantly comes up. It doesn't exist in K-12 education. Anyone trying to convince you that is lying to you. What, what K-12 education seeks to do is racial literacy. Helping students gain the skills to, more, to build a more equitable and just society. Dr. Merlash is the epitome of that excellence in education, and we deserve to have here for as long as he is willing to stay here with us. So I implore the board to approve this contract unanimously. That is what our community needs to see tonight. It has become divided, it has become disgusting, and we need to take a stand tonight that racism has no place in Cherry Hill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yarish. Go to nine. Patrick Matucci, 29 Whitman Avenue. I asked the board to not renew Dr. Malash's contract. I viewed testimony of Cherry Hill faculty and its supporters that clearly shows that none of you are interested in the concerns of those who oppose his renewal, that you've already made up your minds, that this meeting is simply a performance so that you present the appearance and optics of fairness in response to what you believe is mere formality and a foregone conclusion. However, it is my hope that those in attendance who aren't sure where they stand, <clears throat> pardon me, will consider the following questions. If Dr. Malash supporters believe he exercises the virtues of transparency, then why has the Board of Education, its support apparatus, and the Cherry Hill Public School System not reveal the entirety of this year's curriculum to parents who have requested to review it? If there's no political motivation behind their agenda to be concerned with, then why do members of the BOA the Cherry Hill faculty members and their supporters publicly described those opposed to Dr. Malash as a noisy little minority. Why do they claim that they are the majority? These terms and the context in which they're used are totally political in nature. They are polarizing, they are otherizing, and they are divisive. If you're just teaching history, why aren't you teaching all of it? Does your new curriculum teach that a political party was founded to fight against slavery and which party that is? Does it teach the racist history of the opposing political party from the time of the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of the 60s? Does it teach about the systemic damage created by socialist causes championed by that same political party and that have made various minority groups and people of color dependent upon the government <clears throat> part? Does it teach about the oppression prevalent in every Marxist system that's ever existed? Does it teach that Marxism stands diametrically opposed <clears throat> to our own constitution? If you don't teach these things I've described, is it because it makes you uncomfortable? Is it because it doesn't fit with your agenda? If the curriculum doesn't provide a balanced and accurate account of what you call history, then it's not history that's being taught. It's a political agenda being taught. Teaching a political agenda to a child for one hour a day, 180 days a year, for 13 years 
is absolutely the definition of political indoctrination and re-education. And that makes it unacceptable. And for those reasons and others, I cannot support Dr. Malash. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Corcoran, um, Cherry Hill. Um, the past four years, uh, we moved in to town. Uh, my background is I had eight years at St. Peter's Merchantville, and I graduated class 1998 Pensalkin High School. Um, I feel kind of like we're in the, an episode of the Twilight Zone because I'm not sure what everybody's talking about as far as racism being alive. Not in my town, not on my street, not in my kid's school. We're not racists. There are no racists on my street. I live on one of the most diverse streets in, in America. Black, white, Asian, um, you name it. Catholic, Jewish, everybody lives on Banner Road. We all get along. We all take care of each other. We're all friendly. My kids go to the English as a second language school in, in the district. Um, Joseph Sharp, it's a fantastic school. I don't know where all this racism talk is coming from. I don't get it. It's not my world. It's not the world that we live in. And it's being overblown. It's being sensationalized and I don't like it. Um, I don't know what else to say. This is, this is beyond me. This is beyond me. It doesn't exist. Our kids aren't being taught racism. And it's not something that it's coming, it's not coming from the schools already. So Are you I, speaking I, regarding the contract? I don't know whether or not we should extend his contract or not. I don't know. But I, I just wanted to make a comment that I don't know where all of this is coming from. It's not, it's not okay, the, the Cherry Hill that I live in. Right now are specific to the superintendent. That's fantastic. Contract. I don't know. Every, everybody made the comments. I don't know. Okay, don't thank know. you. Okay, that brings us to the end of the public hearing on the contract. I'm now declaring the hearing closed. Okay, that brings us now to approval of minutes. The superintendent recommends and I move the following approval of minutes. Committee of the whole special action meeting minutes and executive session minutes dated July 13th, 2021. 6.2 approval of minutes, regular meeting minutes and executive session minutes dated July 27th, 2021. Do I have a second? Ms. Friedel, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, board members, the online voting is open. You may cast your votes on the approval of the minutes. Ms. Sugars. Ms. I have to abstain for uh, 6.2. Mrs. Sugars, I have to abstain from 6.1. I was absent for the executive session. Ms. Sugars, I need to abstain from 6.1 as well. And Mrs. Sugars, I'm abstaining from 6.1 as well, not having been at that meeting. Okay, we have a unanimous vote other than the exceptions noted. Okay, thank you. We do not have anything this evening for board recognition or under presentation. So that'll bring us to administrative reports and I will turn it over to Dr. Malash for the road forward. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. So I'm very excited tonight because Dr. Mahan, Dr. Morton and I uh, are giving our last road forward update prior to the opening of the academic year. Our students will return on Thursday, September the 9th. We are incredibly excited. Uh, and this is our final update before the beginning of the academic year. We will have additional updates as we, as we open the year, the first one being on September 14th, which is our first board meeting uh, in September. So uh, we're projecting, and go ahead, Dr. Mahan, if you wanna move to the next slide. So as we go through and have the discussion this evening, we're gonna focus on four parts of the presentation. First, just a basic overview of our mission, our goals, 
uh, and our commitments, key information that we are looking at and talking about, and then the road forward committee update, and then some Q&A with the board if there are any questions um, to be answered. We use this foundationally each time we do the presentations, the district mission statement. Every time that we present it, I encourage people to take a look at it. I encourage people to read it and have an understanding about what we do foundationally in the school district, what we see as our mission. This goes from the board members to the administrative teams at the district and at the schools to our teachers. And it's something that we embody in the work that we put in with our students. Our district has three specific strategic planning goals that were adopted by the board in February of 2020. These three overarching goals are what we use to make our decisions when we are talking about curriculum, when we're talking about budgeting, when we're looking at all of the work that goes through. These goals came out of the work of an ad hoc committee that was created um, and was recommended following the bond referendum vote in 2018. Following um, the fall of 2019, there were focus groups that took place at all of our schools. Uh, there were meetings with PTA, there were meetings with staff members. There was an online survey. We ended up with thousands of data points. Uh, there was a group of representative stakeholders from across the district, from board members to students, to parents, to staff members, certificated and non-certificated, that spent a couple of days together and ultimately developed these three goals, which then were adopted by the board in February of 2020. Again, guiding lights for us. These are the district commitments. We have shared these with the community since we've been talking about the road forward and returning back to school full-time in September. These five commitments are what the road forward committee talks about when we speak with our principals, when we speak with our staff, uh, this is what we refer to. These are the commitments that the board has endorsed with the work that we are doing as we prepare to open school. And I am gonna read them. Uh, the district is committed to the following, the health, and safety of students and staff members. That is always the first primary and most important responsibility that we have. Regularly scheduled school days for students, which we begin with on September the 9th. Breakfast and lunch being available and scheduled for students, working in partnership with the New Jersey Department of Ed, New Jersey Department of Health and the Camden County Department of Health to remain informed about the status of community health and communicating information transparency, transparently with students, families, staff members, and the community. And again, September 9th, we borrowed this phrase when we opened up with full day kindergarten, yay for full day. There are only 16 days until the start of the school year begins. So get ready for September the 9th. And then some key information, some things to review. First, uh, in reference to masks, as we know, Governor Murphy on August the 6th signed Executive Order 251. 251 states the following, goes through all public, private, parochial, preschool programs in elementary and secondary schools, including charter and Renaissance schools, must maintain a policy regarding mandatory use of face masks by staff, students, and visitors in the indoor portion of the school district premises, except in the following circumstances. And again, provides criteria. We appreciate everybody that's in attendance tonight for wearing your masks setting that foundation and the expectation, modeling for our children what it is that we expect, respecting the health of everybody that is here. Again, this information goes through a criteria uh, when masks would not be required. Our policy regarding masking has not changed since we returned to school last September uh, as we prepared to open. First, masks must be worn by any adult in the building at all times, unless they are in a room by themselves. There are times we have staff members they're in rooms by themselves where they would not have to have a mask on. By students at all times. On buses, that's a federal mandate that masks have to be worn on buses. In the hallway, cafeteria, and APR, going to and in the restroom, in classrooms. We're asking families, masks should be washed every day, be, every day that they're used before being used again, or if they're visibly soiled, damp, or wet. We will have disposable masks. We have disposable masks that are available tonight if folks forgot them or if they did not have them with them. Any visitor to the building must wear a mask. They will not be permitted to enter the building without a mask. During the academic day, visitors will be screened when they arrive, including a temperature check before they are admitted, admitted to our school buildings. One of the things that we learned last year, uh, one of our bigger focuses all the time is about limiting the access to the building from people from the outside. 
There are only a handful of folks that need to come into the building other than staff and students on a daily basis. We're gonna to continue to uphold that as we move forward. The masking requirement does extend to evening meetings and events held in buildings outside of the school day. It includes PTA events. Part of the process, and we will welcome outside groups to use our facilities again after school and on the weekends, beginning again in September, they will have to adhere to the same policies and practices that go on. Uh, for our students and staff, securing accommodations in regard to masking is a very clear and well-defined process. It involves a licensed physician's orders, a review of the orders by our district's physician and the inclusion of the accommodation in a formalized plan for either students or staff members. We are engaged in that process with a number of those folks right now. Meals, very excited by the work that our team with Aramark has been doing in preparation for meal distribution. Breakfast will be served at school every single day. Lunch will be served at school every single day. In terms of breakfast and in terms of lunch, the Department of Agriculture at the federal level has extended the free meals program. Every child in the district is eligible to receive a free breakfast and a free lunch when they are at school. Now, children are not required to take the, the district provided breakfast or the district provided lunch. Specific information about how that's going to be distributed, where the children are going to eat, will be coming out from principals, I believe this week, 31st, next Tuesday. Uh, that will come out from, from uh, principals. And there will be a different, different types of protocols that'll be in place depending upon the structure of the building, the size and the age of the children. Uh, in this presentation, which we post on our website, there's also a link to the meal calendars uh, where families can go on. I believe they will be updated the week before school opens. And again, as I said, building specific information about meal distribution will be coming out. We are still asking all families to complete um, the application for free and reduced meals. It's important, this free and reduced meal application is something that allows us to secure additional funding for additional programs to support students in many of our schools. Even though the meals will be free for everyone, we are asking every family to still to complete this form. It does have a funding impact on money, many of our schools. And for lunch, same thing. Um, there's information up here about at the elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Uh, a broad overview of what that will look like. Again, specific information will be coming out from the building principals. That's germane based on the size of the school, the enrollment, and what the structure looks like. I will also mention that at the elementary right now, we are still trying to hire additional educational assistants to add additional support specifically during lunch and recess time. We're looking for people basically to work between 10 and two, those four hours in the middle of the day. It's part of the educational assistant group that we have. We want people to come in to be able to provide additional support specifically for lunch and recess. We're looking to hire two new staff members for all 12 of the elementary schools. We are not quite halfway there yet in terms of getting, getting people um, that are interested in taking those positions. So if you know anybody in the neighborhoods, if you know anybody that's at home that's interested, have them go to the website, fill out the information, if they're not sure where to go or to apply, have them contact us directly as well. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Morton, yes? Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Malash. Appreciate those uh, comments. I appreciate you for turning it back over to me. Uh, so the Roll Forward Committee. So as you'll see, uh, meeting dates. We had our third meeting of the committee last week. Uh, great, great conversation. And it's been much time throughout the, the various weeks as well, interacting with members of the committee as they submit uh, various ideas for discussion and suggestions as well. So just to review the composition of the committee. So the committee is composed of 33 members. When I sat down with Dr. Malash initially to talk, talk about the structure and the format we follow, uh, his thinking was that we wanted to have as wide of a representation, as many voices from our community as possible. Um, and as such, our committee is, com is, is composed of parents, uh, board members, administrators at the building level and at the central level, uh, teachers, support staff, uh, it, it, it really is uh, a wide ranging committee. And the charge of the committee was simple. Um, Dr. Malash charged us with taking an intimate, intricate, detailed look at our continuity of learning plan and to thoroughly, thoroughly discuss it. Uh, quote unquote, he charged the committee with providing candid input and perspective, being expressive and sharing thoughts and feelings and ultimately making sound recommendations in the best interest of our students, an interest that would uphold 
the district's commitments to ensure that all students and staff are safe and to ensure that we are able to uh, schedule regular days of school each and every day. So this passionate group of concerned uh, members have done just that. So as, as the committee has moved forward, our focus has been on the health and the safety of all students and staff. That's the primary focus that's that was consistently considered in all discussions and in every interaction. Uh, the committee carefully and deliberately planned in a cautious manner and uh, really tried to take time in considering all options to allow our students to ultimately uphold the district's commitment to ensure that students are regularly scheduled for full days of school. Uh, communication is central, central uh, throughout that and uh, the information that I'll be sharing on subsequ subsequent slides is information that's contained in our continuity of learning plan as well. And that will be accessible at some point in the coming days uh, to you all. Uh, again, as Dr. Malash mentioned, building specific information will be provided. So the continuity of learning plan will give you the broad overview of what our expectations, protocols, and, and procedures are. And our building principals are sending information out as it applies to their buildings and how um, it, it specifically applies to your children. So health and safety protocols. Uh, so mask, obviously, we just discussed. Uh, Dr. Mosh, you know, mentioned all the uh, expectations regarding mask and the governor's executive order, uh, but screening. So we're asking students and staff to conduct screenings before they come into school um, each and every day. They'll do self-assessments um, to screen themselves and um, to ensure that they are healthy and safe. Um, our students, as they come into the school building in the early days of the school year, will be, will be focusing intently on uh, reinforcing personal hygiene and sanitation, sanitization expectations for them. Uh, we wanna make sure that our kids understand uh, the protocols that are necessary to, to keep themselves safe and as safe as possible. Uh, just to reinforce again, masks are an expectation. All visitors, all students, all staff are expected to be in masks uh, with the, the expectations, with a few exceptions rather, that exist. So naturally when students are eating or drinking, students will not be masked. Um, our principals and school staffs have looked closely at that and are putting protocols into place and have submitted plans for uh, those times as well to allow for snacks and for meal access. Accommodations for students and staff, uh, as was mentioned as well, accommodations for students and staff are available uh, by request. Uh, parents are encouraged to contact the building principals to discuss steps necessary to address documented needs. Um, it's just a matter of, of requesting that information. COVID-19 symptoms. So any student or staff displaying symptoms uh, will be sent to the nurse's office for additional screening. Uh, there is uh, a, a quarantine location as well that each school is designated to maintain and designated to have. Uh, our nurses will monitor and manage that system and monitor that location. Uh, they will monitor students in the isolation space and communicate with families and com communicate with parents if it is necessary uh, for students to be sent home and um, to be screened further. There are plans in place. Uh, each, each school um, is closely monitoring the assignment and the location of students in the classroom, on school buses, during lunchtime, and at every other aspect of the day. And that's for contact tracing purposes. We are, we, we are responsible uh, for reporting information about who those who may test positive or who um, display symptoms come in contact with. And as the Department of Health works to execute contact tracing protocols, we need to make sure we notify them of who all the students have been in contact with. So as such, our, our school staffs will be keeping close, um, close count of who our students are interacting with. Uh, there are specific protocols that are mentioned in the continuity of learning plan, uh, just general information about contact tracing as well. COVID 
19 illness and test result scenarios. Uh, you, you, for those who've had children in the district last year, you may have received notification uh, that there was a positive identification in the schools. That, that process will continue. Uh, that, that those letters typically sent from the superintendent's office and then sent as well from uh, the principals out to the school communities um, to notify. We are responsible for working with our nurses. Our nurses, nurses work with the Department of Health. There is a database where information is, is logged into, um, and that's what activates the contact tracing protocols as well. In the event that we are required to close because of um, mass outbreaks, we will follow the, the uh, direction from, from the Camden County Department of Health. We'll make sure we work with them and um, follow the recommendations, follow the, gu the guidelines, timelines, and such, and moving forward. In the event that we are, that students are re required to quarantine, remote learning will be available to these students. So in the event that a student um, tests positive for COVID or a student has an exposure and is required to quarantine, those students will have access to remote learning. The school will make arrangements uh, within a one to three day period uh, to set up information for a live stream. Um, our teachers will provide students with the resources, um, links to the live stream that are necessary, and they will ensure that they, um, the students are included in regular instruction that may take place. Next slide. School operations and procedures. So student flow, entry, exit, and common areas. So student flow, entry, exit, and common areas, this information could differ just a, just a bit by school based upon location and based upon uh, the facility in and of itself. This information will be, pro will be provided by building principals. Um, as we mentioned, I think the day we mentioned was the 31st uh, that this information will come out. Uh, you can expect to see diagrams as well as detailed information about um, arrival, lunchtime, dismissal, um, things along those lines as well. Uh, meal, meal access and cafeteria procedures were mentioned just a bit. Again, building principals will communicate sp specific information for their locations. Um, we are privy, obviously, to the plans that have been set forth. I can tell you that as, as per the district's expectation that all students receive breakfast every day and that all students receive lunch every day, our, our principals are planning for students to be able to maintain social distance to be able to maximize outdoor spaces as much as possible for ventilation purposes and to ensure that all kids are offered the opportunity to eat. Our students may bring a lunch with them themselves, but as was mentioned, lunch will be available and breakfast will be available free of charge to all of our students this year. Again, we're, we're encouraging all of our families, ensure that you complete the free and reduced meal lunch application. Visitors to school. So visitors to school will have to, have to follow a screening process. We will um, ensure that temperature check is taken and um, make sure that the person is, is safe before they are able to enter the building. Uh, we're asking, as we have in the past, uh, for appointments to be made. Uh, so visitors should have appointments um, prior to, to visiting the school and, be, and receiving access to such. Transportation, so transportation. So students on school buses uh, will be required to be masked. Our students will be required to be masked as per um, mandate. Um, bus drivers will be masked, bus aides will be masked at all times as well. Um, masks will be provided by the district if uh, bus drivers or students do not have one. Um, all routes will have assigned seating. So this goes back to the contact, contact tracing protocols that we talked about just a bit. Uh, siblings and members of the same household may sit together, uh, but students are expected to remain in their assigned seats throughout the duration of, of the time that they're assigned to a specific bus. Uh, windows will be 
Some windows will be open on the bus to try to create uh, ventilation and airflow. Um, and then high touch areas on the bus will be sanitized between routes as well. And each, each bus will be thoroughly sanitized at the end of the run in the evening. So this year we're trying to normalize the experience as much as possible. Um, sharing of items will be permitted. As I mentioned earlier on the personal hygiene slide, um, we are trying to reinforce health and safety procedures. And that includes uh, hand washing, hand cleaning, um, sanitizing one's hands. There's sanitizer available uh, in all classrooms and all locations. You'll probably see many bottles around this, this auditorium here, as well as hand wipes. So we'll be encouraging our kids and exhorting them to do just that, to make sure that they're following proper hygiene procedures to ensure that they're able to, to share items this year. Playgrounds will be utilized. Again, playgrounds will be utilized this year. Uh, to go back to what I just said, uh, personal hygiene will be of primary importance and, and, and it will be reinforced for us to ensure that our kids can continue using, their play, using playgrounds. So use of lockers. So there've been quite a few questions about the use of lockers. Um, at the secondary level, the middle and high school levels, lockers will, will universally not be assigned as they had been in the past, but lockers are available upon request. So if an individual um, is desirous of using a locker, you simply just have to make a request through the principal and that will be arranged for you, all right? So, but lockers are available upon request, but um, we're not, we're not, we're generally trying to ensure that um, there's, uh, there's proper traffic flow and that there isn't any loitering or standing around in the hallways uh, where kids could congregate and large groups could come together. Facilities cleaning practices. So the facility will be thoroughly cleaned on an ongoing basis. Uh, high touch areas will be uh, regularly sanitized and cleaned. Um, there is a schedule that our facilities department has put together uh, to ensure that restrooms, cafeteria spaces, uh, doors, doorknobs, each, each and every classroom is cleaned thoroughly. Uh, at, the end of, at the end of the night, there are disinfected, disinfection protocols that take place. Um, the use of electric static misters, for instance, at night is something that, that does occur. Um, to ensure that all these different areas are ready for service during the day and the, the next day following as well. Uh, we'll be promoting proper ventilation as well. Uh, I believe there are portable air purifiers that have been purchased for all classrooms and for all office suites also. So those are on their way out to schools if they have not arrived already. Um, we'll be encouraging teachers as well at times to, to maintain windows open and to try to just maintain ventilation um, in the rooms as, as well. So the first days of school. So again, it was mentioned 16 days, 16 days, and we will be back um, for a time that I think we've all been looking forward to for, for our kids coming back. Elementary schools, schedule is 9 a.m. to 3.30 uh, on the first day. Elementary schools will have an early dismissal, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, but middle schools and high schools will be in school full time. So middle schools, 8 to, to 3 p.m. And high schools, 7.30 to 2.30. Early on for us, as we move forward, um, it'll be really important for us to, to reconnect with, uh, with our students. Uh, focus will be on social emotional learning. We want to assess the needs. Um, the social emotional needs of our of our children, and um, like I said, begin to reacclimate them to school, identify what those needs are, and get them the supports that they need as necessary. Um, obviously, engaging all learners will be of critical importance as well. Um, very important after students have been uh, disconnected from regular routines of schools to normalize them again to classroom and instructional routines as well as health and safety procedures and routines as well. So as I mentioned, the personal hygiene um, protocols that we were looking to teach, we're looking to teach these universal health and safety procedures and routines to our students also. 
be very important to go through technology expectations uh, and the use of the various virtual platforms also. While our students have been thrust into a remote world, and as you know, as a, as a dad, I've I've seen the I've seen both perspectives. I have a son who has done exceptionally well, another one who's had difficulty. Um, but this technology um, or use of technology has had some positive effects as well. So we want to maximize the positive benefits uh, that technology has afforded us, and um, as we teach expectations for our kids about responsible and acceptable uses of, of technology. And then parent communications will be very important. I think this is something that we've talked about quite extensively with the Road Forward Committee, uh, how to best communicate information, uh, what information is important to be shared, uh, timelines for the sharing of information. Uh, but these are, these are expectations that we have for staff um, to, to share specific information that applies to specific schools, to specific classrooms, to specific children. And I think that's what, that's what I've heard loud and clear from the, low, the Road Forward Committee. Uh, next slide. Extracurricular activities and, and athletics. So athletics, our athletics program will, will move forward um, as it has in the past. Um, our athletics department um, will be following NJ SIAA expectations and protocols and, and NJSIA protocols will follow what, what state guidance um, dictates. So if there are mandates that come from the state, the NJSIAA will implement those and we'll follow suit as well as a district. But as of right now, we're moving forward with our athletics program. We will have spectators at, at games and events. Um, I believe football at High School West is scheduled to open just this Friday, I believe, and, and, and East um, over the weekend. So we're definitely looking forward to moving forward with our athletics program. Uh, physical education. So students will fully, fully, phys fully participate in physical education this year. Uh, with one caveat, our locker rooms will not be utilized. So students should come to phys ed class prepared and ready to participate. Um, again, proper hygiene is, is essential and important. Uh, we'll be maximizing outdoor resources and outdoor spaces as much as possible. Students will share PE equipment. They will share supplies in PE, all right? So the expectation is that supplies will be, will be sanitized um, in between uses and students will sanitize their hands, whether they use sanitizer, hand sanitizer, or they, they, they go and have a full hand washing routine that they follow. Our school dances and proms. Uh, so toward the end of the year, as, as things began to lighten and the situation um, did improve, uh, we were able to schedule several dances and proms and um, we just changed venues. So instead of holding things in indoor spaces, we moved and looked at outdoor spaces. So, you know, it's presents an opportunity for us to be creative and look at some, some different spaces that provide adequate uh, ventilation and such. Um, and, and we'll be looking to do that again this year as we look to, to um, reintroduce school dances, proms, and things along those lines this year. Uh, we will be having musical concerts as well. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of proper hygiene and safety and sanit sanitation, sanitation and social distance for everyone. Um, musical concerts that may be inside will require spectators at this point to be masked. Uh, and school plays, musicals, and theatrical productions We'll be moving forward. Uh, we're moving forward with that as well. We're going to respect the safety protocols that exist, um, but but we're excited that we're moving forward in these areas. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mahan. Thank you, Dr. Morton, and thank you to Dr. Malash. Our next slide speaks to student supports. As you are all aware, we have a, a very robust English as a Second Language program. We offer English as a second language in six of our elementary schools and all of our secondary schools. This continuum of services will continue in person. Regarding school age childcare, the SAC program is preparing to welcome students back for the 2021-2022 school year. If you have not registered and you need before or after care for your elementary age child, 
please go to our district website where you can find all forms and information. Again, the program is ready, operational, and functional for the upcoming school year. We recognize that students will continue to need supports for online learning. When I speak of needing supports for online learning, there were definitely some takeaways that we took away during the pandemic, including some technology-based platforms that we will continue to use during the 2021-2022 academic year. Teachers, as well as our technology team, are familiar with these platforms and will continue to support students as they utilize them. Our technology department continues to support, excuse me, our technology department continues to support the closing of the digital divide. We continue to provide devices to students in need so that they can complete their assignments and connect into the classroom as needed. We also continue to provide hotspots so families can have access to internet and Wi-Fi. The studentsupport.com email continues to be alive and well for parents, students, community members to have any of their technology issues addressed. Our special education and related services. Again, we have a continuum of services to support this population of students. Something that we learned during the pandemic is that sometimes having virtual meetings for parents is the most effective. So IEP meetings will be held virtual and or in person as agreed upon with the parents. All related services for students will be held in person. And on a previous slide, Dr. Malash spoke about lunch and breakfast. I just wanna make sure that everyone is aware that for many students in out of district placements, we have many students in out-of-district placements. They will also receive free lunch and breakfast during the 2021-2022 school year. Grading. Classroom teachers will continue to communicate the grading practices, which we have in place within Cherry Hill Public Schools. We will continue to administer district assessments and standardized tests. The Start Strong Assessment which we are, which we must implement as dictated by the New Jersey Department of Education will be implemented between September 13th and October 22nd. Information regarding the Start Strong Assessment will be shared with all families. The New Jersey Student Learning Assessment, we have not received information as to when this will be administered in the spring of 2022. All of the report card and interim dates have been established and posted to the district website. Parents will be able to view their children's report card through the Genesis Parent Portal. District communication. So Dr. Malash and Dr. Morton both referenced communication from the building principals. Although we provide a district view of the the road forward, it is imperative that the building principals provide information to their school communities. We have mentioned August 31st numerous times. So what will you receive on August 31st? You will receive a welcome back letter from the principal. They will share diagrams of their schools, detailed directions of arrival and dismissal procedures, detailed breakfast and lunch procedures, pictures of classrooms, documents that they believe are pertinent to their individual school communities, a welcome letter from our superintendent, Dr. Joseph Malash, and information on back to school nights. All of this information will be targeted and specific to the respective school. There is a significant amount of district communication that is also readily available. It includes weekly newsletters, minute with Dr. Malash videos, social media, district website postings and emails. And then as I've already mentioned, school-based communication, which really seems to be the most important when reaching out to our families, which again includes updates from the principals, social media, websites, and blackboards. I cannot emphasize enough that there is a significant amount of information that is readily available. If for some reason you do not have access 
please reach out. We will either provide it and or connect you with the right person. The safe return plan is posted to the district website. If you would like to review that plan, it speaks to how we as a district are planning to return safely. Formal presentations will continue tonight being one. The next formal presentation will be on September 14th. And lastly, as always, we thank you for giving us the platform to be able to share with you the road forward plan for Cherry Hill Public Schools. We welcome your questions, the feedback and discussion. And I just wanna take a minute to have everyone just look at this slide. This is a slide um, in this picture from Cherry Hill High School West graduation this year. And I just want us to re be remembered, or excuse me, I just want us to remember that we serve children. And if that smile does not resonate with all of you, that irregardless of what our experience has been, your experience has been, we have students who are happy, healthy, thriving, and successful, even during the pandemic. So as Dr. Malas kicked off the presentation, yay for full day and a return to school, we are 16 days away and we are excited and encouraged to welcome almost 11,000 students back into the halls of Cherry Hill Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahan, Dr. Morton, and Dr. Malosh for that presentation. Were there any questions from the board members? Ms. Stern. Thank you, Mrs. Neary, and thank you to Dr. Malosh, Dr. Mahan, and, and Dr. Morton. Really helpful, very detailed. I know it's kind of a lot of information, but I think providing that just always helps us all understand what's happening and stay informed. Um, so, um, and I just want to mention a couple things, just a couple questions. I'm excited to be part of the Road Forward Committee. A lot of great discussion there. Um, I just wanted to check on the, um, any updates on the covered, they're not tents, I know, they're kind of covers that are going to go outside, I, in terms of the timing of when they might be in and whether or not students will be able to be outside, perhaps for lunch, if to know as part of the discussion, even if they haven't arrived in time. That's my first yeah, question. So the, the, the shade structures we expect sometime late in September, they've been delayed. Uh, there are some supply chain issues with getting all of the materials to put them up at the 12 elementary schools. Children will still be allowed to go outside uh, and there'll still be opportunity to eat outside even without the sh shade structures being in place. Thank you. And then um, just to clarify, and I think this was already just stated last year, but that students who are fully vaccinated if there's an exposure, is it that they do not need to quarantine? Is that still the case? They do not, Mr. Ms. McCoy, Ms. Weathington was just confirming the information. If they're fully vaccinated, um, they do not need to quarantine if there's an exposure. Okay, thank you. And I had one more question. Um, as I wrote down, and now I'm looking through my notes to try to find it and struggling a little bit. Um, I may have to come back to it. Um, I apologize for the delay. Just want to also thank you very much for the, um, you know, communication about that in one week, there'll be detailed plans coming out, I think answering a lot of questions that a lot of people have. So I just really wanna thank you for that um, timing on that. Oh, this was the last, just, just confirming, um, Dr. Malasha, you've previously said that schools will remain open unless there is a directive given to us. Is that, could you just, just clarify that? Yes, the, the work that we've been doing in preparation for opening a school, unless we receive a, di a directive from the governor where the governor again closes schools down statewide uh, or a directive from the Department of Health, we will continue to have schools open and maintain full days of school. 
Thank you for reiterating that and clarifying. That's it, Mrs. Neary. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. Were there any other questions? Ms. Stratton. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. Um, uh, kudos to the admin team and the committee row four for putting this together. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple not clarifying questions um, for the community. So um, one of the major concerns is, is not having those lunch plans. And so just to reinforce what you said, that parents or guardians or caregivers should contact the school principal directly um, unless they want to just wait for that information to come, right? Yes, yeah, so if there are building specific questions, they should contact the building principal. Um, detailed information will come out from all of the building principals next Tuesday. Um, they're all scheduled to send it out on the same day so that there is consistency with when people receive that information. You know that there's at times a bit of a competitive nature with uh, how information is received. Absolutely. So, and then um, my other question was um, pertaining to this plan, uh, just so that everybody is clear for parents, again, parents and caregivers, this should be treated like a living document at this point. So we, we can't expect for this to be set in stone should there be changes COVID-wise or otherwise. This is a living document that should be continued to be changed or no? It is a living document, right? So, so we're gonna be faced with different things that are going on during the course of the academic year. There's a draft of the continuity of learning plan that is posted online after tonight's meeting tomorrow. An update of that draft will be on there with some of the additional questions that have been asked will be included and more clarification that is there. We'll actually ask the board to vote to approve it on the 14th of September at that board meeting. Uh, it'll be listed for action, um, but it is a, li a living document. You know, it's right now, it's the, the best information that we have available. You know, we just found out uh, yesterday with executive order 253 that all of our staff members are gonna have to be vaccinated uh, or face testing by October, the, by October the 18th. There are additional guidelines that'll come along with that. That will influence what's contained within our document. As more information becomes available, we will continue to update it, we'll continue to present, continue to share that information as it goes through. Um, there's just a, a natural fluidity with what occurs in schools. Um, part of it's the beautiful part of working with children uh, and working with so many children that we are fortunate you know, to have in our schools. Uh, and the other part is just dealing with you know, the uncertainty of what's going on in the world around us. Thank you for, for uh, clarifying that. And then my, my, I guess, last question, hold on, I had it. Down. Oh, um, for Genesis, uh, and, and I'll admittedly say, again, I know I'm very clear with this board on how much I'm not connected when it comes to this technology stuff, um, but for the Genesis, for, for all of our new learners or and some of our learners that haven't even come to school yet and some of those families, where do they go to get the, a lot of the information or the, the things that are necessary before the start? Dr. Mahan? Great, great question, Mrs. Elmer Stratton. Genesis Parent Portal, when our families register through the registration office, they are immediately connected into all of the technology platforms that we utilize within the district. So as we begin to send messages out, um, particularly one that will be going out tomorrow, alerting parents that student schedules and information is available in Genesis, that will go out to all new families as well. We, our departments are consistently in communication, the registration office with the technology department and making sure that we have email addresses, contact information for families so that they do not miss out on pertinent information. That information is also available to our building principals when they send out electronic communication via Blackboard. It is also included, um, includes any new families to the district if for whatever reason a new family hears that something was sent out and they did not receive it, immediately reach out to the building principal because that information is available. Great, because that, that, that's exactly what I was going to mention is that we're still going to use all those other forms in your communication slide like SMORE and Blackboard and all those different channels. Too. Yes, all of the forms. Um, actually, when you receive the correspondence in the coming days, parents will have to complete all of their forms through the Genesis Parent Portal in order to have access to schedules and other pertinent information. Got it, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Were there any other questions? Oh. 
Thank you. Um, I just also want to say thank you to the administration. That was a well uh, detailed plan for the reopening. I, I have three questions. The first is, uh, will the road forward committee continue to meet after the opening of school? Is it something that will continue through the fall? I, I mean, I don't want to project the entire year, but will you be meeting reflecting um, pivoting? So I will chime in here and say, um, absolutely, Dr. Morton will be meeting with the Road Forward <laughs> Committee moving forward because um, the Continuity of Learning Return to Learn Committee, um, when I asked those individuals to participate, I asked them to meet with me for two, two weeks. We will be back in school, maybe three months, that now 18 months later, almost two years. Um, I can imagine that we will continue to get mandates that are changing, just as Dr. Malash just mentioned, vaccination mandates for staff and contracted providers. So in order for us to respond to the needs of the community, as well as the needs of our staff and students, we will absolutely need to be meeting. Thank you. And I'm sure Dr. Morton says, you're welcome. <laughs> He has. Uh, my next question is, when the students are back in the classrooms in 16 days, will the learning be more of a hands-on model uh, that we are traditionally used to? Um, are Chromebooks going to be used? I guess that's the question. Like the students aren't coming in, bringing their Chromebooks in and using the Chromebooks, or are they going to be, you know, hands-on learning? Yeah, that's, that's sort of what I was uh, alluding to in terms of um, technology um, expectations. So we'll, we'll, we'll utilize technology in a positive manner, the things that we saw that actually uh, served as a benefit for, for students, um, applications to accelerate learning. Um, however, if you're asking if the students will be in person and learning virtually through a computer, a Zoom, no, they, they will not. We'll go back to a traditional hands-on instructional model. Okay, thank you. And my last question is, so on the 14th, when we are asked to approve the, the plan, will there be a portion of that plan that has a contingency in the hopefully never happens that even for a short period of time, the district goes full remote? Yeah, so that's one of the things as well that the Road Forward Committee will, will be looking at. Um, there's an expectation that we'll have a plan in place and submitted by the end of October. Uh, I believe the date is the 28th that we're looking at. We're, we're possibly looking to try to put something ro you know, robust and thorough uh, even before that. But that road forward committee will be charged with, with looking at that plan. Okay, so there's a, a, a later due date for that piece. Yes, yes Ms. Friedel, yes. there's a, a due date for the Department of Ed that we have to submit that plan for. So they've given us till the end of October. Um, so there will be a contingency that's being built. Um, should something happen in an emergency before that's done, submitted to the Department of Ed, um, we would make announcements about what that would look like, most likely revert back to something similar to what we did last year. Great. Thank you. That's all my questions. I, I had a quick question um, on the heels of Ms. Friedel's question. Um, and then we're looking at those contingency plans. Are we looking at changing and modifying um, for what worked and what didn't work and the learnings from last year as part of that, should we need to go full remote again or even hybrid? Yeah, so one of, one of the fantastic things about uh, that committee is that it's a, it's a, it's a diverse group um, of individuals who experienced the pandemic in all different ways. And I think uh, the candor and, and, you know, of the conversations has been great. Um, so we are looking at what worked. We do not want to repeat what did not work. <laughs> so, so we'll be looking at, you know, building a comprehensive and, and thorough plan and, and something that we that we believe in for moving forward. Great. Thank you. Ms. Stern. Um, just a quick comment as a member of the Road Forward Committee, I just want to echo that, um, you know, I, I think there's, it's been a really very lively interactive group. A lot of voices are being heard. And I, I really appreciate that in the group. And I think, um, you know, I think there's a huge commitment from the people there. And there's, there's, there's a positive energy about being part of that, even though it's yes, 
Dr. Mahan going to be a long, long haul for this uh, committee. Um, and I think one thing that was really positive is recently too, I just want to thank um, Dr. Morton for sharing. Um, you know, people are on the committee are, are bringing ideas and, and sharing plans that they're learning about from other districts. And that's being shared with the entire group and, and being brought to the table. So I think there's so much openness about learning and taking really the best strategies, the best approaches. So just wanted to comment on that. And, and, and I know for myself, that's a wonderful part of being part of the committee is, is having that really robust dialogue. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. Was there any other comments or question? Okay, thank you. That'll bring us to correspondence. Did any members of the board have correspondence? Okay. Then we will move to our student reps to the board at this time to give their updates. First, Ariana is going to speak. Hi, um, good evening. So unfortunately, Ariana couldn't make it today. So my name is Eve. Um, oh, my apologies. Thank you. No problem. So first to talk about things taking place at East over these next few weeks. Um, so freshman orientation will take place from September 1st, um, 8.30 to 3.30 p.m. And it will allow incoming students to ease into high school with the help of upperclassmen who volunteer to lead in small groups. Um, and I've heard many great things about the freshmen, about the tours that they had over the last few weeks, and they're very optimistic about, optimistic about um, their new school year at East. Preseason is going well for fall athletes currently. Um, they're getting into drills that'll help them ready get, for, get ready for games and also team bonding activities. Um, for example, girls soccer had an Olympics day where they broke up into eight teams and they really enjoyed it. Um, and then some incoming seniors attended a free college essay workshop, which took place from 2.30 to 6 p.m. on July 15th. And then again yesterday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and they were able to get some great personal and supplemental essays done with the help of a teacher. And lastly, uh, Jewish students are looking forward to Rosh Hashanah, which is September 6th and September 8th. Um, next, in regards to clubs for this year, club officers are promoting their clubs through Instagram and the Cherry Hill East Activities Instagram, and they're encouraging all incoming students to join or reach out with any questions. Um, Drama Club is planning on doing all four shows this year um, as if it would be a normal year, and hopefully um, they're going to host the Halloween dance and field trips to Broadway shows or local productions. Um, and then the club tools for school just had their two annual packing events last week in Philadelphia and two weeks ago in Margate. Their goal is to fill as many backpacks as they can for students in need. And with fundraising and sponsorships, they packed over 3000 backpacks, which was amazing to see. Um, student organizers, Gina Liu and Aiden Rude, um, with students for later start times recently met uh, with the board, um, President Neary and district administrators, and we're proud to help initiate a process that will in the future examine our school start times for the future. And they wanted to thank you for your support. Um, the club Students for Solar Energy aims to get the board to implement clean and renewable solar energy throughout the district and primarily are pushing for an assessment of Cherry Hill Schools to see where solar panels can be placed. They've already met with a few administrators who have expressed their openness, but also drawbacks such as obviously finances and space. Um, but they continue to push uh, for the Board of Education to look further and implement. And then our school newspaper Eastside is finally excited to meet again in person after a year of virtual meetings and are looking um, forward to an amazing year. Um, moving on, in a random survey regarding student opinion on this year's summer reading selection, about 54% of students said that they liked the selection, while the other 46 expressed discontent. Um, and then of the students that expressed their discontent, 
Um, they ultimately liked the theme, but they felt that the theme did not reflect um, the required AP readings or their book of choice properly. Um, and the reason for that could be because of the designated themes for each grade level as these had done in previous years, which they did not do this year's. Um, so a designated set of question for each um, grade level would ensure that all students are provided books um, in regards to their skill level and variety of content. Um, and then lastly, we have some updates regarding how to better support how, how to better support students go going back in person from our principal, Dr. Perry. Um, so our current administration advocates for mental health with um, the extra training provided for, for guidance counselors over the summer to support students both academically and emotionally. This training included gaining knowledge of resources in our community to support students. Um, as Dr. Malosh mentioned earlier, everyone gets a uh, free breakfast and free lunch if they choose um, this year provided by Aramar. And for this lunch break at East, in order to provide structure for students to get acclimated first, there will be mandatory homeroom, at least for the first few months of school um, for the freshmen. And we will also open up the courtyard adjacent to the annex, which is another um, place outside for students can sit and have more room to um, eat outside without being clustered indoors. Um, and then, as Dr. Mahan mentioned earlier, student schedule will be available in Genesis starting tomorrow with the teachers and the schedule A through E. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the student report for Wes and Kevin Salvatorelli. Hello, and thank you. Um, so I'm going to start off with some school news, which is, first of all, a clarification on our school start times and also the breakfast or before school breakfast. So Aramark will be providing before school breakfast, um, which will be available from approximately 7.15 to 7.30. All students are able to get that for free, uh, thanks to a program by the USDA. Um, school will be starting at 7.30 with classes starting at 7.30. So I recommend to all my peers to uh, start setting your alarms now because that is a drastic change from our 9.45 last year. Um, today also marked the first day of our freshman orientations. Um, freshman orientation runs across three days here at West, um, and we provide incoming students, which are not only freshmen, but also of other grade levels, um, an opportunity to explore the school, meet their peers and teachers, and run through their schedule, and most importantly, be welcome to the amazing West and Cherry Hill communities. Um, the orientation is expected to conclude with a, the iconic barbecue, which is run by West administrators for all people who attend the in orientations. In activities news, we have the Senior Sunrise event, which is um, planned by the Class of 2022 Executive Committee. Um, and it will run at 6.30 a.m. on the first day of school. Um, it is a symbolic of the beginnings of the last year of school for our seniors. Um, it will help show or help bring everyone in to a smooth transition for the start of the school year. The peer leaders will also be going to the YMCA of the Pines on August 29th and August 30th, which will be continuing this year's long tradition of team building and learning. The peer leaders program provides um, additional support to incoming freshmen, as well as students across the school to help get them equated back to the normal six day schedule, as well as the overall high school environment. Um, in department news, the vocal music program is excited to welcome our new incoming choir teacher. Um, we, they have very big shoes to fill, and we are very excited to welcome into, him into the program. The theater program is currently optimistic for the upcoming theatrical season, um, and we are currently in the process of finalizing the musicals that we will be performing this year. We can expect them to be publicized maybe in the next few weeks. Um, and the instrumental music program and the marching band has begun its band camp, which is an opportunity for members of the band at all grade levels, including some middle schoolers, to interact and build a strong team spirit that will lead us into the coming season. Um, in athletics news, fall sports have officially started and the fall sports program represents an opportunity for students to showcase their skills to the greater community. Sports also act as an important outlet for students uh, in the high stress environments schools sometimes can be. The West community is elated to see the return of fall sports in full swing for the school year. Specifically for the football team, they've also started their scrimmages and are preparing for upcoming games with the, during the school year. The football team has been uh, trying to raise funds for equipment, sideline replay, um, as well as safety equipment and some other things. 
uh, they are they so far raised around seven thousand dollars of their ten thousand dollar goal, and we would let, uh, encourage everyone to donate if they are able to. Um, ROTC uh, NJ seven seven hundred seven eighty first um, is excited to possibly be welcoming a new senior um, aerospace science instructor, and is looking forward to a successful year. The senior cadets of the AFJ ROTC program have been hard at work preparing for the incoming school year. Cadets in the top five, which is the corps. Our core's um, cadre have been working on for, uh, finalizing the unit goals and constructing the cadet staff, the support squadron commander, and logistics officer have been planning out uniform distribution. The awareness presentation team has been at the student uh, orientations in an effort to recruit new cadets into the program. They also plan on being uh, at many um, community oriented events. Uh, during the school year, which includes tonight, as they off open the doors for everyone. And this is a welcome return after the lack of events during COVID-19. Um, and then for final student comments, uh, we're all looking forward to this amazing safe return to public uh, to in-person education. And all students are highly grateful for the hard work going into the return to school. Um, and we cannot wait to be back in our buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to our first public comment section. And this is for board action items only, 15 through 18, excluding item 17.16. And it will be held to the three minute limit. And as always, please state your full name and municipality. Okay, we have Crystal Ye on the line. Hi. Um, <clears throat> uh, is there a timer going on right now? Okay. There's confusion from the public if 15.11 includes the AA curriculum. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Yara. I will acknowledge that in a moment. Just give us one moment, Crystal. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Crystal, apologies for that. Uh, it's all good. Um, I just had a question though, just as a student, is it all right if what I say next isn't part of the agenda? As a student, we always let the student speak first. You can go ahead and speak in the first public comment. 
Oh, okay, thank you so much. So uh, as I mentioned, my name is Crystal Ye, and I am a rising sophomore at Cherry Hill High School East. And um, <clears throat> the impending dangers of climate change affect us all, and the Cherry Hill District, who highly value the well-being of their students and staff, should do their part to implement solar panels in the district to protect both our community and our Earth. By continuing to use the same non-renewable energy sources we are currently using, we're not only enabling the fast progression of climate change, but we are also directly worsening students' asthma and the air quality around us. An assessment of the school district will find where these solar panels could be installed. Uh, solar panels are extremely versatile and can be placed on the school roofs, on unused fields, over parking lots, for streetlights, and more. And solar panels over the parking lots would also help protect the lots against snow freezing over and from rain pouring down as students and staff walk to their car. And just as other school districts have implemented solar panels such as Stratford, Evesham, Gloucester, and Voorhees, Cherry Hill should as well, especially as the 11th largest district in New Jersey, since we'd also have a larger carbon footprint from the consumption of fossil fuels. And without solar panels, we're also wasting money on non-renewable energy that could be allocated to other more important areas in the district. To install solar panels, we don't need to wait years for a bond to be passed, especially since so many renovations are currently happening at the moment all over the district. We can do it through a third party. In fact, 79% of the solar uh, of solar panels installed in schools was financed by a third party, party such as a solar developer. This allows schools and districts, regardless of the size of their budget, to purchase solar energy and receive immediate energy cost savings. After talking to Dr. Smith, um, former assistant superintendent and now current Eve Sham superintendent, we found that this is exactly what their district did. They had solar panels installed through a power purchase agreement and all costs were built into the project. There were no upfront costs to the school district and the Evesham School District now buys its electricity from the company Spano Solar Enterprises, who installed the systems at a discounted rate. And the district now saves $30,000 to $35,000 a year at each site. Now, on behalf of my fellow classmates and staff, I speak for their health. And on behalf of our taxpaying parents, I speak for an effective use of their money to the district. And on behalf of our planet and home we share, I speak for actively working against the progression of climate change before the damage is irreversible. I ask you now to please have an assessment of the schools to see where solar panels can be installed in this district. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Crystal. Okay, Mrs. Yaras, apologies for that. Thank you. So I could speak on the AA curriculum in 15.11? Yes. Okay, Alana Yaras, uh, Cherry Hill. As a member of the Jewish community, I'm thankful for my ancestors before me who spoke out against the education of the Holocaust in New Jersey and in the United States. And without them, I believe that people would still not be educated about the Holocaust. The same thing is happening now with the African-American studies curriculum, that there are people speaking out against the education of our children and how they should learn about how they have been treated in this country. And I just thank the district for uh, hopefully approving this curriculum so that all students feel that they are represented in the curriculum the way I, as a Jewish person, feel represented when the Holocaust is discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ciaris. Okay, we have an audience. My name is Nick Gaudio and I'm a resident of Cherry Hill. Thank you for taking into consideration all the requests from the August 10th Board of Ed meeting regarding implementing a hybrid session with public comment option for those viewing remotely. Regarding the new New Jersey state mandate on faculty and staff being vaccinated or oppressively having to endure invas two invasive COVID tests per week, I'm asking the board to ensure that to its constituents that the state of New Jersey will be covering 100% of the expenses for these tests. If the state will not cover these costs in full, the Board of Ed should be pushing back with a letter of grievance. Mr. Gaudio, what agenda item are you speaking to? Well, it seemed like everyone was just speaking about whatever they open comment at this point. No, they stated the agenda item. We let the students speak first, and Mrs. Yara stated agenda item 15.11. Okay, I'm uh, speaking about several different agenda items. 
which action item. Otherwise, it is for the second public comment. There wasn't an agenda handed out at the door. So I don't have the exact numbers. Yeah, it's also online, Mr. Vaudio. So right, if there isn't a specific on, action my, item, you can speak. Under this. Okay, I then you can see. speak at the second public comment. Thank you. And this part's not the appropriate place to speak to the board. No, not unless it is a specific action item. Segregation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm also a student with Chris Boyer, so is it okay if I speak now? Yes, absolutely. Right. Students can speak in the first. All right, thank you. So, hi, my name is Ellie No, and I'm a rising sophomore at Cherry, Cherry Hill East. I'm here to express my concerns for the rate the impacts of climate change have been affecting us, especially with the rising temperatures in New Jersey. The 2020 New Jersey Climate Change Scientific Report by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection from June 30th, 2020 states that New Jersey is warming faster than the rest of the Northeast region and the world. Considering this, I believe that it is important to start acting now before the environment can no longer support us. We must act by implementing renewable energy methods, specifically solar panels, and assessing the school for locations where solar panels can be implemented. It is significant that we add solar panels as it shows that Cherry Hill schools are acting towards a sustainable future. We must act in unity and follow the footsteps of the rising number of school districts that are implementing solar, such as some of the schools in the East Sham School District. Lastly, I would also like the board to consider the idea of including a more in-depth unit in the curriculum to change, to change to create awareness as to the state of the uh, environment in their futures. It is also important to educate them to increase the student voice and to promote more action and focus towards the environment. Us students are the future, so I'm emphasizing that care, protection, and education for the environment is necessary in order for us to live in an environment that can help us create our future pathways as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the audience, sorry. Okay. Jessica Mazur, Cherry Hill. Um, I want to talk about the comments and the fight against the African American Studies course by some members of our community. Um, it's disgusting at best. They want this to is, gloss. I'm sorry, Ms. May. This is for item 15.11. Yes. Oh, yes, you. I'm sorry. Um, they want to gloss over to the reality of the history of people of color, not only in this country, but right here in Cherry Hill, and dismiss the responsibility the rest of us have to validate those very real experiences. It's uncomfortable to learn that one's success is often tied to the family you were born into, your socioeconomic status, and even the zip code instead of hard work and intellect. When you are accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. But when you know better, you can make the choice to do better. Our students asked for this. The status quo of turning a blind eye is no longer acceptable to them and shouldn't be to us. I'm incredibly, incredibly proud that Cherry Hill is embracing this responsibility and facing the challenge head on. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mazur. Okay. There are no other public comments. I'll hand it over oh, to oh, the- oh, 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 oh. Good evening. Rick Short, 1002 Chilton Parkway, United States of America. Uh, two things to reference on the uh, solar stuff. Um, just so the which young, agenda items are you speaking to, Mr. Short? The which last one. Items? The last one at the uh, fifteen point eleven. Yes. That's not an action item. So if, okay, then I'll I'll move ahead on the uh, to the other comment about the what, what was it the AAA? Is that correct? Okay. The, my final comment's gonna be a lot better than this, but I sit here and this entire town is against each other. It is nuts. It is crazy. My own neighbors, we can agree on everything. Everything we can agree on, mostly, sanably. But when we start talking about racism, it just gaslights everything. This is becoming disgusting, the way everything it is. And my neighbor is so close, and we're so, ugh, it's sad. 
But my last public comment will go directly to Dr. Malash. We are tired. We need answers. Jennifer Nadio, Cherry Hill Township, uh, 1511. <clears throat> I have really paid attention to all of this that we're doing with the African American Studies class, and I think it's a really good idea. <clears throat> the concern that I have, and I've had this for a while, is that A, I would really like to have updated uh, textbooks so that when people are learning history, it's a complete history of a lot of different cultures, lifestyles, um, and even as most of you know, I'm very connected to the special education world. That too should be included. Um, family and friends of mine have told me that they've opened up history books or books in high school and their parents' names are in those books. Their neighbors' names are in those books. I think we need to get up to date. And I think that the African American Studies is a really great start. I'm thrilled to death that we are having um, ICR classes. With that, I think that's so inclusive and so wonderful. I just would also like the history books themselves to be updated. Um, and I would also like to have a little more about people with neurodivergence um, and differences within their learning as well. So I just wanted to bring that up, but I did wanna say that I, I think this is a great idea and I really enjoyed um, all of the presentations on uh, the AA class. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nagy. And we have one caller on the line, Eliza Babcock. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Eliza Babcock of Cherry Hill. Um, thank you. And um, this is in regards to 15.11. Um, I wanted to take a moment to praise the district for adding the African American Studies curriculum. While it's only one step in the right direction, the student led effort backed by this administration is a brilliant addition to our curriculum and moves us toward a well rounded civics experience for young curious minds. I myself am a graduate of Cherry Hill West class of 2000. I have to tell you that the, um, the social equity initiatives and the additional curriculum I see now stand unfortunately in stark contrast to the total lack thereof in previous years. It's badly needed and it's and the one history class should be treated simply as a starting point. Our multicultural student body should feel represented in their learning experience. There's a lot of resistance, misinformation, and fear surrounding DEI, critical race theory, and a broadened curriculum. I would urge the Board to, of Education to continue to set precedent and press forward, if for no other reason than our students are demanding it. Listen to the group of brave high school students who pushed and pushed for this. They are the change makers and the people that you are most accountable to. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Babcock. And now to the audience. Uh, Debbie Samuels, Cherry Hill. With regards to the African-American, Negro, Black, the history class, I didn't have that when I was here in Cherry Hill, but fortunate for me, I'm a descendant of a Guinea slave, who, Guinea prince, who was kidnapped in Africa and brought to the United States. My family has been here since the 1800s and we have our history tracked to 1650, this Guinea prince who was brought over. I never knew, I was taught, we had learned about slavery. And then of course, when we came along, we learned about the civil rights. But there is so much history, not only in America, but African-American history in this township. My brother played on the 
Cherry Hill Little League team, and they were the first Blacks to play in the Little League World Series. And little kids now need to know our history, not just African-American history, but local history, which isn't taught in school. We need to be respectful of everyone's origins and everyone's history because we all are American history. Those that came over by slave ship, those that came over with Christopher Columbus, even the barnacles came over. But we need to teach the history as it is written and not covered up. And it's not about race, it's about the truth and American history. And I am so glad to see that this is being brought out to our students for them to learn what really American history is. Black history, Latino American history, Asian history. It's all American history because we're all here in America needing to live as one united country. And until we start teaching our kids, if you don't know where you came from, you won't know where you're going. Thank you. Okay, next we have on the line, Greg Becker. And please uh, note what agenda item we're speaking to. Hi, I'm sorry, this is Beth Becker. I'm on vacation and it came up with my husband's name. Um, Beth Becker, Cherry Hill, uh, item 15.11. Um, about the African American Studies course. First of all, I'm just again, wanna say how proud I am, am of Cherry Hill for implementing this student-led action. Um, also that the African American Studies course is the first step in creating a district that sees and embraces all of our children. Um, this work will not only prepare our children to be uh, better humans, but better citizens and show them the value in themselves and each other. Um, I know there's a lot of fear in the community, but as a large district, um, this course is not only going to educate our students, but it's going to educate the community. And um, it's obvious that our community sorely needs education. I um, echo the sentiments of the woman who spoke before me. Um, the story of that 1955 Cherry Hill Little League team uh, and what they encountered when they went to play in the Southern States is, is fascinating. Um, we have an Underground Railroad uh, station right here in Cherry Hill that most people don't even know about. Um, this history is local. Um, it is uh, not only local, it's national, it's universal. Um, and I just wanted to, again, commend the district for taking this step and for leading, um, leading our community uh, and educating our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Becker. And now to the audience. And please state your agenda item. Patrick Matucci, item 1511. I, I just wanted to respond to some of the other responses that we're hearing regarding uh, accusations of racism. A person is not a racist because they don't see eye to eye with you. And you have no moral authority to be lecturing anyone on anything. It sounds like some of the people that claim to be the best educators really need to look in the mirror and learn a few things themselves. My opposition is not to African American studies. My opposition is to the political agenda and the politicizing of the agenda itself and the way that you're, present, you're presenting it to our children. That's my opposition. I'm absolutely for the teaching of history. I don't want history to repeat itself. I, I agree with everything that you said about we're all Americans. What I don't agree with is what I see on social media, the conversations that we're having with one another, wagging our fingers, and accusing people of terrible things just because they don't agree with you? I think we could do better than this. I think we have to do better than this. If you want this curriculum to be successful, you absolutely have to be inclusive. You can't just talk about being inclusive and you can't just talk about equity 
while a whole contingent of your community is ostracized, mocked on social media, and otherized, and whatever else you want to call it. It's not right. It's not fair. Some of the people that are standing in opposition to the way in which this curriculum is being presented, <clears throat> pardon me, could be your best friends on other matters that are super important. Think about who you're talking to. Think about the way you're talking to people. Show a little bit more respect. You get a lot more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of the first public comment. I will now hand it over to Dr. Malash for superintendent comments. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. Uh, I do just have a, a couple of brief comments, uh, especially given the time with where we are. First, I want to thank the students for being here tonight and giving us, us the updates about what's going on at High School East and High School West. Always a highlight for us. Um, I also want to thank the members of the ROTC who were here with us this evening as we moved the board mo me uh, meeting over to this building to help with people that were coming in to distribute masks if folks forgot them uh, and to welcome members of the community. Um, so for Mr. Boucher and for the ROTC folks that were here, thank you to them. Uh, thank you to Dr. Damon, who's the principal here at High School West. Some of you not, have not had a chance yet to meet Dr. Damon, uh, but again, she was able to shift some things to be able to welcome the board uh, and the rest of us to be here this evening uh, and to the facilities crew here at High School West as they prepare for the opening of school. Uh, it's busy times in all of our buildings as the students talked about with what was going on at High School East and High School West. We've had new student orientations. In fact, tomorrow, we have the opportunity to welcome all of our new staff members to the district. We'll be here in this room. Uh, and again, none of that is, is going to happen as we get ready to open schools without the work that our facilities, um, grounds, maintenance crews, custodial crews, our cleaners, uh, the men and women in this district who dedicate themselves, take pride in their job, and day in, day out, night in, and night out, make sure that our buildings are ready to open. I had the great opportunity to speak with all of them last week as they were here uh, for some training one afternoon and just had the opportunity to thank them on behalf of our 11,000 students uh, and the, the rest of the 1,700 employees that we have in the district. Because again, if they don't do their jobs, we can't open schools. Uh, and these men and women have done an incredible job during the course of the last 19 months. So I ask everybody, whether you're here in the audience tonight uh, or you're watching online or watching a recording of this, next time you're in one of our buildings, thank the custodians, thank the cleaners, thank the maintenance folks uh, who are out there because uh, they're the ones that allow us to open our buildings. As we mentioned a number of times, 16 more days until school opens, September 9th, full days of school. The caveat, again, that Dr. Mayhem went over, that is an early dismissal day. It's a one o'clock day for our elementary schools. That's always a one o'clock day. So please make sure you know what time your children need to arrive at school and what time school is over for them. Uh, we are incredibly excited about being back on a full um, full-time schedule and a regular schedule. Um, excited with the work that we've been able to do with Mr. Bridges. Ted Bridges is our manager through Aramark. He's been with us for about 14 months now. Um, our Aramark team, during the time that we uh, have been dealing with the pandemic, we've distributed more than a million meals uh, to children in our community. Uh, it's an absolutely incredible uh, job that they have done to prepare the meals, to update the, cal uh, to update the menus, to change the foods that are going out. Uh, we're looking to continue to build upon that as school opens. So again, if you have questions about meals or what's going on, please make sure that you contact um, the building. Uh, there's uh, spaces online to be able to find out what meals are going to be served. Um, we talked before just about uh, Executive Order 253, which does require all of our staff members to be vaccinated or to be tested. Uh, and that is, is effective or goes into effect now. Uh, and it uh, will start to be implemented effective October the 18th. Uh, information is going out to our staff members. Um, we did a, a straw poll survey of staff during the course of the summer. We had almost a thousand people respond to the survey. Um, of that thousand or so people, 95% of them indicated they would be fully vaccinated or are fully vaccinated and would be fully vaccinated uh, by September the 9th. I'm sure once we get through all 1700 of them, um, we may not be that high right now, uh, but our staff has done a great job led by the folks uh, with Ms. Adrian and the um, Human Resources uh, Office back last year, uh, helped to support our staff to get the vaccinations um, to get them done. We've run additional vaccination clinics during the course of the summer. 
um, so that students who wanted to be vaccinated from 12 and above could do that. Uh, also some family members were vaccinated. We run uh, vaccination clinics with our Rite Aid pharmacies through our schools. We'll be continuing to do that. Uh, Mark Adler from Adler's Pharmacy ran the, the clinics during the course of the summer for us, for which we are very appreciative. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am and to have all of our staff members and all of our students back in our schools. Um, it's gonna be a transition time for everyone. It's going to be different. What it feels like in September of 2021 for sure is not going to be what it felt like in 2020 or 2019 or 2018. Uh, our staff members, our building administrators, our teams of people are ready and are going to be here to support the kids. It's going to take some time for everybody to get used to being back in school and for what six and a half hours during the course of the day looks like and feels like. Kids are going to be tired at the beginning of the year. Please, at home, start practicing with your kids wearing their masks. Uh, if they are not wearing their masks regularly, start to practice. You know, kids need to build up that endurance. It does take time to get used to it again. We continue to see during our ESY and our summer programs, our students had their masks on. That has not changed for us. Our students um, do a nice job with it. They ask questions, they talk about it, they know, understand and know what the role is. Fall sports have all started, fall activities are beginning. Um, one of the highlights, that I saw as I talked to Mr. Barrow, who's our director of athletics, has been the number of freshmen that are out for sports this year. Um, and as he had talked, as he has talked to the freshman kids, one of the things they talked about was the reintroduction of the B teams at the middle level, which we did a couple of years ago. And that has dramatically bolstered the number of kids that are continuing to play sports as they move into the high schools. I encourage everyone in the community to come out and to see our kids compete once the fall seasons begin at the middle schools and at the high schools. Come see our marching bands as they play and as they compete. Uh, pay attention to what's going on within the district. Follow along on our social media. And I implore people, if you have questions about what's going on in the district, contact the district. Please do not rely on social media. Please do not rely on Facebook as the sole source of information about what's going on in the district. If you want to know what's being taught in a class or you want to have a discussion about what's being taught in a class, especially a new class, which has not yet been taught in the district, and that nobody has seen, ask us. We'd be happy to sit down with folks. Dr. Mahan, Dr. Morton, myself, Mrs. Wethington, other people that are involved. You wanna talk about what's gonna be included in the African-American studies class? Ask us. We are really excited to talk about it. I can't be more proud of the work that our teachers and our students and members of our community have done to prepare this class and to set the foundation to do this work. Critical race theory, CRT, is not part of the class. It's not part of the curriculum. It's not the foundation of it. It is not. And for people to continue to get up to say that that's what's in there, again, continuing to spell, to spread a false narrative. It's just not true. It's just not true. If you wanna talk about what's in the class, please reach out to us. Again, we are accessible, we are available, we are easy to find, and we are more than happy to talk about it. So 16 days, get ready for school. Please start to pay attention with what's going on as buses are picking up. Remind your neighbors as kids are out uh, getting to school that it's gonna be busy. Um, and again, we were excited to welcome everybody back. I'm thrilled for the teachers to be back. Our teachers did such an incredible job during the course of the pandemic to continue the education going. Uh, a much needed respite for so many of them during the course of the summer. I know the staff is excited to have the children back in the school and to have that interaction, that relationship that exists as we watch children learn and develop. Thank you, Mrs. Neal. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Okay, that brings us to our action agenda. And first we have curriculum and instruction, and I will turn that over to Mrs. Matlack to move that agenda. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. One, approval of attendance at conferences and workshops for the 2021-2022 school year. Two, approval of the district student placement for 2021 2020-21 school year. Approval of out of district student placement for 2021-2022 school year. Approval of service con number four. Approval of out of service contract for the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired for 2021-2022. Five, approval of service agreement for the 2021 2022 school year, uh, GC, SS, SD, 
song with the lights, it's hard to say. <clears throat> Six, approval of agreement for the 2021-2022 school year for his pediatric. Seven, resolution approving a professional services agreement between Cherry Hill Board and Cooper Health <clears throat> to provide reading multi-sensory remediation services at Pulitz Day, Day School. Eight, hmm. number eight, approval of professional development proposal. Nine, approval of the fiscal impact of the professional development plan. 10, resolution for membership in a consortium for mental health and optimal development. 11, approval of readopting curriculum. And 12, <clears throat> approval of memorandum of understanding for 2021-2022 school year. So I have a second. Mrs. Stern, any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, board members, the online voting is open. And we have a unanimous vote. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Sugars. That now brings us to the business and facilities portion of the agenda, and I will turn it over to Mrs. Schultz to move that. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. Number one, financial reports. Number two, resolutions. Number three, approval of non-public school security and technology plans. Number four, resolution for the award of transportation. And number five, acceptance of donations. Do I have a second? Mr. Avadia, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, board members, the online voting is open. Mrs. Sugars, I need to abstain to Henry Shine on the bill list, please. Other than the exception noted, we have a unanimous vote. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Sugars. I will turn it back to Mrs. Schultz to move the human resources agenda. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. Number one, termination of employment certificated. Number two, termination of employment non-certificated. Number three, appointment certificated. Number four, appointments non-certificated. Number five, leaves of absence certificated. Number six, leaves of absence non-certificated. Number seven, a sal assignment salary change certificated. Number eight, assignment salary change non-certificated. Number nine, other compensation certificated. Number 10, first reading of policies. Number 11, approval of a new job description, revision and job title. Number 12, approval of a new job description, revision. Number 13, approval of a new job description, new stipend position. Number 14, abolishment of job description. Number 15, affiliation agreement. And number 16, other motions. Do I have a second? Mr. Avadia, are there any questions? Ms. Friedel. So it's not, a, it's not a question, but I do need to make a statement, Ms. Sugars. I will be abstaining from 17.16 based on an advisory from the School Ethics Commission. Thank you, Ms. Friedel. Ms. Stern. I had just have to make a note. I have to abstain from 17.3. Or avoid a conflict of interest. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Are there any other questions? Seeing none. Okay, ladies, I have noted both of your exceptions and you may cast your votes otherwise. Other than the exceptions noted, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. That brings us to policy and legislation, and I will turn it over to Ms. Rydell to move that agenda. The superintendent 
Recommends and I move the following 18.1 approval of waiver of regulation 2340 field trips. Do I have a second? Mrs. Matlack, any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, board members, the online voting is open. And we have a unanimous vote. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. We don't have any items for strategic planning this evening, so that brings us to new business. Does anyone have any new business this evening? Okay, that'll take us to old business. Did anyone have any items under old business this evening? Okay, that will now bring us to the second public comment. Okay, and due to the late hour, we're going to limit that comment to two minutes per comment. Okay, and the first public comment. Is anybody coming to the mic from the audience? Please reset the timer. I'm ready to speak. Please reset the timer at three minutes so I can have my three minutes to speak. Second public comment will be two minutes per comment. Three minutes per comment. Can you please reset it to three minutes? I have three minutes to speak. I was following the procedure and working down the microphone for my safety. Sir, please start your comments or move on. I'll start my comment when the, the timer is reset to three minutes. On. Start your comment or move on. You know to speak, I need to take this off. Thank you. I'm 30 feet from everybody else in here. Okay, Let's be logical. Like make a, my name is Nick Gaudio and I'm a resident of Cherry Hill. Thank you for- Thank you, we'll take recess.
Okay, thank you. We'll reconvene starting at two minutes for public comment at the podium. Uh, uh, Dr. Malash, and I spoke and said three minutes, right? Thank you. My name is Nick Gaudio, and I'm a resident of Troy Hill. Thank you for taking into consideration all the requests from the August 10th Board of Ed meeting regarding implementing a hybrid session with public comment option for those viewing remotely. Regarding the new state, New Jersey state mandate on faculty and staff being vaccinated or oppressively having to endure two invasive COVID tests per week, I am asking that the I'm asking the board to ensure to its constituents that the state of New Jersey will be covering 100% of the expenses for these tests. If the state will not cover these costs in full, the Board of Ed should be pushing back with a letter of grievance in support of the rights of our hardworking teachers and staff to ensure that they will not be financially penalized for not enduring the state prescribed medical treatment that would otherwise be optional. I'm also requesting that the Board of Ed pushes back on the state with another letter of grievance in support of its school children and employees. A tremendously large percentage of the families and children in this school district have been traveling, visiting friends and family, indoors and outdoors, hanging out in huge groups throughout the summer with no regard for social distancing or masking. Most of the parents who are fighting to oppress our students, faculty and staff are hypocritically virtue signaling and trying to guilt trip the Board of Ed to make politically correct statements and actions or lack thereof in support of a senseless and abusive restriction on a normal and healthy bodily function. Instead of drafting a letter to the governor in opposition to Executive Order 251, the school board has chosen to side with the state against the children, against its teachers, in a physically abusive manner, all in the name of political correctness and virtue signaling. The mask I'm currently wearing contains a 40 millimeter NATO filter that provides significant protection against biological threats, including viruses. The loose fitting offered an improperly worn cotton mask that the majority of Thank students you, Mr. And teachers are going to be wearing to class. Thank you, Mr. Gaudio. Dr. Malash did not agree to that at all. No, no, no. You said you were good to wear your mask. Thank you, Mr. Gaudio, for your comments. Next, we'll go to the comment online from Steffi Graff. Hi, Stephanie from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Stephanie Graff, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, I just wanted to thank the board um, for your time and service. I know it's a thankless job with a significant time commitment, so thank you. Um, second thing is um, I do appreciate um, those of you that stated your reason for abstaining from any vote. So um, if you can just consider that, I think that's really helpful for the public that you state the reason for abstaining if you're abstaining from any vote. Um, Thirdly, I am extremely disappointed that once again, Sally Tong is not at a meeting. Um, I think this is the second one this month and she's frequently absent. Um, it's a large cause of concern for me when she is running again for the Board of Ed um, and she doesn't manage to show up to half the meetings. And um, thirdly, I am completely appalled that um, Mr. Gaudio could come to the microphone and speak and is running for Board of Ed and does not know the rules of a Board of Ed meeting, does not understand when public comment is taken and what the rules are, um, and is running for a position on this board um, without knowing the rules and knowledge prior to prior to putting in his, his application. So that's it. Thank you again. Thank you, Mrs. Graff. Do we have another comment from the audience? You can submit your statement, Mr. Gaudio. You can submit an email, thank you. Uh, Ivana Cooper, Cherry Hill. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I know it's been a long night. Uh, I have my 15 year old son here. Uh, my comment is uh, different in comparison to this evening's uh, agenda. I came out here as a concerned parent worried about my kid. <laughs> and I know that a lot of parents are here with largely vast uh, issues that are individual. Or I'm just focused on mine at the moment. Um, 
I am a mom that homeschooled my kids for eight years, enrolled my son in Beck uh, 2019, 2020 school year. And then because of all of the unsurety of the 2020, 2021 school year, or 2019, 2020 school year, um, I unenrolled him uh, and then homeschooled him again. I enrolled him again at the end of last year um, for this upcoming school year and was today sent an email by East telling me that he would not be enrolled in 10th grade um, because he was homeschooled for the ninth grade year. So my issue is a little different and I know that I can't get an immediate answer, but I came up here and, and brought him with me tonight. You see he's falling asleep sitting over there um, because I'm just looking to have my face known. Um, I sent a ton of emails today. Um, I apologize to Dr. Morton and um, those who got like 17 emails from me today. Um, I'm just a concerned parent trying to make sure that my son gets into school. Um, I had a long conversation today with Allison um, at West, the assistant principal. I'm so grateful to her. She was really the most helpful person I've spoken to so far. Um, and she assured me that somebody would eventually get back to me. But as everybody keeps saying, 16 days, everybody's excited. I'm a nervous wreck. <laughs> just trying to make sure that my son gets into the school. Um, so I would appreciate um, just some attention to this matter for me and my family um, as time is coming up. And I didn't realize there would be any issue um, with getting him enrolled. I assumed it would be as simple as re-enrolling my daughters, but um, we've been met with some issues and uh, East has not been helpful. So at this point, I would love to just enroll him at West. I hear that they're going to be more cooperative and helpful. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, that brings us to, I believe it's the number with 856. I believe it's Dr. Potterwood. Can I still speak? Thank you. Yeah, somebody's online. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, Jeff Potterwitz, uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I'm reading from an article. Uh, I'm just gonna read from the article, okay? It's from 2001. Cherry Hill welcomed all types and made room for everyone back then, said Bob Cook, one of the first blacks to graduate from Cherry Hill High School after it opened in the late 1950s. Mr. Cook, a long-term Burlington County administrator who returned to Cherry Hill after college, said there was always a great deal of cooperation here. Okay. Uh, he was a member of the Little League team that reached the finals of the Little League World Series in 1955 and 1956, a feat accomplished only three other times. Mick, Mr. Cook was one of three black players on the team, which meant it was integrated before the local major league team, the Philadelphia Phillies, which did not have a black player on its roster until 1957. He remembered going to Front Royal Virginia for the 1955 regional finals as a signal moment in his education. When the team went downtown to a movie, the three black players were sent to the colored section in the balcony while their white teammates were seated downstairs. It was not what we ever had experienced at home, said Mr. Cook who noted that the experience spurred the three black players to enter the civil rights movement at teenagers. And we never experienced it later either. Cherry Hill schools were long a melting pot and I think a good place for a black, a young black man or anyone for that matter to grow up. The article is entitled The Dilemma of, Discre of Desegregation, New York Times by Robert Strauss, March 11, 2001. That's called, it's the dilemma of desegregation. If you could Google it, you'll find it. And I think you heard a little bit of that story, at least I heard it uh, earlier in the day. And that's it right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Podowitz. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Hi, thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Adam Greenbaum. I'm from Cherry Hill and I have a six-year-old starting first grade in a few weeks. Uh, it's my first time attending a board meeting in person, and it's, it's certainly been interesting. Uh, usually I, I listen to the live stream, which I, I find very informative, so thank you for that transparency. Uh, I also hear the comments every week, though, and uh, it's, I mean, tonight was really no different. Uh, I, I mostly came here tonight to say thank you for your hard work. Uh, everything you do is really appreciated, even if I don't agree with every decision. You guys kept the schools open, you kept the kids safe. I, I can't thank you enough for that. Uh, I'm also optimistic about the increased focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially the African-American uh, studies class. Uh, when I studied history uh, 30 plus years ago, the version I learned had a lot of gaps in it. 
there are a lot of significant events that were brushed over or whitewashed. And a lot of those things I had to learn on my own when I grew up. Um, I'm very excited for my son to have an opportunity to learn a more complete and a more accurate version of history, as well as uh, gain an understanding of how past events still impact people today. Uh, I thank you for your work on that, and I really hope materials will be made available to parents like me who want to learn alongside with our children. I also wanted to speak mass briefly about the mask mandate. You know, I hear the comments here. I see the discussions online, whether it's people coordinating to send their kids maskless to see what happens, shopping around for a doctor that's going to write them a medical exemption, or showing up to board meetings maskless and causing disruptions. I don't think any of us wanted to be here an extra half hour for that tonight. But if you want to see what happens when you don't control community spread and you send your kids to school maskless anyway, look what's happening in Florida, Georgia, Texas, all these other schools. Uh, hospitalizations are up, schools are closing, uh, and that's not happening here because our vaccination rates are higher, especially here in Cherry Hill. Please do the right thing. Get your kids Thank you. masks, teach them to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have online Nick Bevitt. Hi. Oh, there we go. Sorry, Carolina Bevitt, Cherry Hill. Um, I just wanted to comment on the road forward presentation. I appreciate the more detailed presentation we got tonight, but I'd also like to mention that the quote that is highlighted at every board meeting, an ever-changing world, I feel like sometimes that's not really evident when the, the um, guidance comes out, such as saying that masks aren't needed outside, COVID transmission isn't really happening outside, but yet we still require masks outside or COVID isn't transferred by touch, yet we're still misting and, you know, sanitizing everything to the point where kindergarten students can't have their work hung on the board because it curls up when the misters come out. So I'd like us to please, um, in this ever-changing world, recognize the guidance that lets us have some normalcy back, not just the guidance that takes normalcy away, for especially for our youngest students. Let rugs back in the classroom. Don't, you know, I'll help, try to allow bulletin boards because kids like seeing their work up on the board. It makes them feel proud. And um, please, no masks outside, at least. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bevan. Next, we'll go to the audience. Uh, Yoni Yaris, uh, first, I want to be the first to congratulate Dr. Malash on this well earned. I'm excited for the next five years in our district. Uh, moving on, uh, today was our final distribution for the kosher food distribution that's been taking place at Kilmer that I, I've often given updates about. One final thank you to all of you, to Dr. Rickentrude, Dr. Malash, the Sugar's office, who all worked with us to make this incredibly successful. Our final total for that distribution site is 1,300,036, 248 meals given out at that site, which brings our number in conjunction with the district to over 2.4 million meals given out in Cherry Hill. That is an incredible effort between all of us and collaboration of what can happen to take place. I'm asking the board to help us and join our campaign to get all the children fed. Right now, the USDA and Congress has chosen that school choice and parents who in other parts of the country have chosen to keep their kids at home because their states are not practicing safe guidelines, have lost access to meals, where a child's education should not dictate where they get food. So please consider at a future board meeting to pass the resolution or whatever that is to support this campaign and say to the USDA and New Jersey Department of Agriculture, that meals choice should be available for everyone. The district has done a great job giving out to private school students and homeschooled students, and let's try to keep that going. Uh, we've been a dent finally in childhood hunger and food insecurity in this country, and now I'm afraid we're gonna go backwards. And for those who have not gone through the process for SNAP, it could take months, it could take even longer. Um, this is a great way for us to be able to help everyone. So thank, thank you again from the bottom of my heart. This would not have been possible without the district's collaboration with us, and it was really awesome. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yars. Okay, next we have Kristen on the line. If you could state your full name and municipality, please. Thank you, Kristen Master, Cherry Hill. Uh, two pivotal steps have been taken towards keeping our children safe thus far, universal masking and mandatory vaccination or routine testing, both of which are free of charge regardless of insurance status. 
This is for school staff. Uh, in the interest of our children, all staff should be vaccinated. I know it's not 100% protection, but it is close. And as Dr. Malash has said and repeated, we need to implement as many mitigation strategies against COVID-19 consistently and take a layered approach to provide the most benefit. This is a mitigation method that is available to us and we should utilize it. There is a lag inherent in testing. Once a staff member tests positive, they have already exposed an entire class. What happens if there are vacancies due to non-compliance or staff hesitance to return to the building due to their own fears of contracting and transmitting COVID? What happens if a staff has a medical reason to not be vaccinated, even those that perhaps received the first dose in a two-dose series? Possibly these teachers are el eligible to be remote teachers. Will these regulations also be applied to a substitute pool? I value our teachers and school staff immensely. They performed miracles last year and rose to the unfortunate occasion we all found ourselves in together. I would be remiss if I did not once again mention the importance of providing virtual instruction for those that need it, possibly medically fragile, under 12, unable to get vaccinated, for those that have an immune compromised parent, for those that fared better in a remote setting, for those families that have been living comfortably on the extreme end of caution. Um, sorry, it would be traumatizing to our children to explain why they still cannot go inside their grandparents' house where everyone is vaccinated, but they can go into a school with hundreds of unvaccinated people. This does not infringe upon those wanting in-person instruction. You know what does? Having you, closed Kristen. schools. Oh, two minutes is too short. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Hi, Mary Hubbard, uh, Cherry Hill resident for 20 years this December, um, parent to uh, a rising seventh grader and rising 10th grader. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to um, thank the administration and the board. Um, I've been watching online and now in person um, and just really genuinely wanted to thank you for what you're doing in the interests of our children. I know that you don't hear it enough and I know that you're hearing the voices of some, but there are some of us out there who believe that you're doing a good job and really support you and thank you for being here for hours and dealing with what you're having to deal with. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next we have on the line Aiden Rude. Hi, um, my name is Aiden Rude. I live in Cherry Hill and I'm a student at Cherry Hill East. I want to echo previous commenters in saying thank you to our board and administrators for their service. And as this meeting has been very long, I'll keep my comments very brief. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank the board for allowing comments to continue virtually. Um, I wouldn't have been able to make a comment tonight uh, if uh, not, because um, things just come up. And so it's great to have uh, this transparency and let people participate in as many ways as possible. And second, I just wanted to uh, state my support for the students who have been advocating for more use of solar power and renewable energy in the district. I think it's super important that we uh, move forward into the future with as much sustainability uh, in our district as possible. And we should be continuing to look for new ways to improve on that issue in our schools. So I hope that you will uh, continue working to look for new ways to make our district more energy efficient and sustainable. Thanks so much. Thank you, Aiden. Next, we'll go to the audience. Rick Short, 1002 Chelton Parkway in the great state of America. I love my family. I love my police department. These are the questions I have. I'll have three questions for Dr. Malash directly tonight. It's my opinion, the most dangerous thing right now to the township of Cherry Hill, New Jersey is critical race theory. It has arrived, ladies and gentlemen, right here. I asked the following questions for Dr. Malash. Number one, is Dr. Gleason anti-capitalist? Is he anti-police? Is he also wealth distrib distribution? Second question, is Dr. Kinde also anti-capitalist, anti-police, anti and, and wealth distribution? distribution. 
is Dr. Kendi big on teaching the oppressed and the oppressor? And finally, your comment with Dr. Muhammad, who says this. To disrupt, to unhinge oppression for other people. That's what it means to build a better world for all. So I hope we realize. So unhinge all kinds of anger, all kinds of hate. Yes, this is the Cherry Hill critical race theory, and you are watching it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Short. Next we have on the line, Kristen Viglietta. Hi, good evening, Kristen Viglietta, and I'm a resident of Cherry Hill. Um, I just have a question of clarification from the road forward presentation. Um, in taking a layered approach to the mitigation against COVID, the district has purchased air purifiers for each classroom, which is awesome. What, if anything, though, is the district doing or has the district purchased um, to improve ventilation in large spaces that will be used for lunch when students are unmasked and gym when students will possibly be unmasked during aerobic activity? Um, I know some elementary schools are using classrooms, but many um, elementary level and secondary level are using those larger spaces like cafeterias, APRs, and gyms. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vigiliata. And next to the audience. Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill. Um, you as board members serve in a thankless role, a volunteer role that I have for the past year and a half been serving in myself. You are criticized for every little thing. I know that I, as a member of the public, have also sometimes criticized you, but running the food distribution program that I've been running with volunteers for the past 18 months is a also thankless job. Students who are home on quarantine will not be able to get these meals. Students who have been receiving weekend meals this past year will not be able to get these meals. Students under the age of five who are not enrolled in the schools will not be able to get these meals. And there's currently a change.org petition that can be found on feedallthechildren.com to get meals for those home on quarantine, weekend meals under the age of five School choice should not dictate the meals that the USDA is giving to all children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sierras. Okay, next we have on the line, Christina Musso. Hi, <clears throat> hi, sorry, Christina Musso, Cherry Hill. <clears throat> I wanted to thank Dr. Morton for the extensive uh, presentation and additional information tonight. It was really um, a breath of fresh air to see uh, that information being proposed into the public. And I'm sorry if my comment will or will be um, addressed via you know, something that's gonna be posted later on. One thing I'd like to say is I'm a little disheartened at how great people have said about getting communicated to when some people don't even get acknowledgement of emails being sent. So I was a little disheartened that I brought up questions not um, to complain, but legitimate questions just to ask for some information. And I don't even get acknowledgement that my email is addressed and I know the board can't respond. So um, the one thing I wanted to say is I keep asking about what to do when you have a child, where, you know, this whole like the COVID checklist does not address certain things. I had a situation last year where I didn't know because one son was sick, the other one had to stay home and for, the, for a COVID test. I don't know what's going to be. And if, I'm sorry if this information is available and it's changed. But my point was that the COVID checklist doesn't necessarily include information. I didn't know that I had to keep my children home until I spoke to the school nurse. She sent me a link to a document from the New Jersey Department of Health where there was a footnote on page 19. All I'm asking for is that there's more information and detailed policies so that we can prepare and advance contingency plans. We had a problem in the house recently where one child was exhibiting a head cold, COVID-like symptoms. I didn't, if we were in school, I wouldn't know what to do. If I had to keep both of them, both children home, get a negative COVID test. Two days later, me, my son and myself started exhibiting. Technically, if anybody in the house is exhibiting those symptoms, they need to get tested. So I'm just asking for these, you know, if kids are going to be home. Things are opened up more. I just would like some better instruction on what to do because what's going to happen you, is that parents. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, next we have on the line, David Lodge. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right, good. This is directed to Dr. Malochi. Dr. Malochi, thank you for speaking on this critic on the African American history criteria. And I shall be contacting you regarding the American African American history curriculum. It's been evasive to this point. It's not on the website, and we really need to know what the curriculum is. And going forward, factual history curriculum. Factual history curriculum should embrace all ethnicities to include African-American history, but the compulsory curriculum appears to be a dangerous Trojan horse ushering in critical race theory, placing this, the safety and welfare of Cherry Hill at risk and fails to serve other student ethnicities. A Cherry Hill student was highlighted in a news interview who had been inspired by Black Lives Matter, and you, Dr. Malochi, said that the students spoke and we listened. Antifa and Black Lives Matter engage in thuggery, vandalism, and hate-filled rhetoric of our military and of peace officers. So there's little wonder that there's a sense of alarm in this community over such a curriculum. Inclusion of critical race theorists in this curriculum is ex exploitation of malleable minds and contains dangerous involuntary biased indoctrination, which can only lead to the same violent crimes against anyone who does not support their ideology. This Board of Education is denying the rightful authority of the parents of this community to prevent this. Dr. Kendi references, as a crime against decency, anyone who feels that all lives and labels them, uh, that rather all lives matter and labels them as white racist, and he provides other divisive and racist ideologies steeped in shame and guilt contingent on skin color. In video on the abolitionist website, Dr. Goldie Muhammad advocates violence from students when she says, we want them to agitate, to disrupt, to unhinge, oppression for other people, advocating raising our Thank children to be so violent advocates. Our anarchists. Okay, I don't see any other comments online, so that'll bring us to the end of our second public comment. We do not have any items for second executive session this evening, so that will bring us to the end of our agenda. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Mrs. Stratton, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Have a good evening.